Good evening. I call to order the June 27, 2022 City Council Successor Agency to the Redevelopment Agency Housing Authority regular meeting. Would you all please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? <clears throat> Item three is changes to the order of the agenda. Are there any changes? No changes from staff uh, this evening, uh, Mayor. Or A is a proclamation for Parks and Recreation Month. Hi, Amy. <laughs> okay, today we're going to recognize July 2022 as Parks and Recreation Month. Whereas the U.S. House of Representatives has designated July as Parks and Recreation Month, and whereas Parks and Recreation is an integral part of communities throughout this country, including the city of San Carlos, and whereas Parks and Recreation promotes time spent in nature, which positively impacts mental health by increasing cognitive performance and well being and alleviating illnesses such as depression, attention deficit deficit disorders and Alzheimer's, and whereas park and recreation programming and educational activities such as out of school time programming, youth sports and environmental education are critical to childhood development. And whereas parks and recreation increases a community's economic prosperity through increased property values, expansion of the local tax base, increased tourism, and the attraction and retention of businesses and crime reduction. And whereas our parks and natural recreation areas ensure the ecological beauty of our community and provide a place for children and adults to connect with nature and recreate outdoors. And whereas thousands of children, adults, and seniors benefit from the wide range of services, facilities, and programs provided by the San Carlos Parks and Recreation Department, including the Youth Center and Senior Meal Program, the events such as Hometown Days, the Goblin Walk, Night of Holiday Lights, Music in the Park, and Family Camp Out. And whereas the City of San Carlos recognizes that parks and recreation areas are fundamental to the well-being of our community, in enriching the lives of its residents and visitors, as well as adding value to the community's homes and neighborhoods. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that I, Sarah McDowell, Mayor, and... Ethan. Ethan. Mayor. Ethan, Mayor. Yep. Of the City of San Carlos, on behalf of the City Council, do hereby declare July 2022 as Parks and Recreation Month, and in doing so, urge the community to continue to use and enjoy our parks and recreational opportunities. Thank you, Amy. We're going to go sit down. We'll listen to Amy. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and our guest mayor for the evening. Um, just want to take a minute to thank the mayor and council for once again recognizing parks and recreation profession, our programs, our events, our facilities in the community again this July 2022. Um, we hit the ground running this summer, as you may know, and so hope to see you guys out in our camps or our events, our concerts, our movies, um, and to roll into fall, our art and wine fair that we are taking on this year um, and all of our fall events. So thank you for your support. As always, it is greatly appreciated. Four B is approximation for outgoing commissioners. Okay, so I'm going to call Don Bradley up. Don, I'm gonna present you with a proclamation. We also um, note the service of Mark Berger, um, Nishant Garg, and Sandy Nirenberg tonight, but I don't think they're here to join us, but I wanna thank them very much for their service. But I'm going to come up, and would you like to come with me, Eason? Okay, we'll present this to Mr. Bradley. Okay, come on. 
Ready? Don, it's such an honor to have you here tonight. You've been such a wonderful public servant. I remember when I was serving on EDAC, you were serving on the Planning Commission and we went and walked downtown together. And um, I just really wanna appreciate your service tonight. So I'm gonna read you your proclamation, if that's okay. All right. Whereas Donald W. Bradley was appointed to this appointed by the City Council in 2016 to serve on the Planning Commission and was reappointed for another term in 2019. And whereas as a Planning Commissioner, Donald Bradley's primary duties were to participate in the administration of the zoning laws and policies of the city, make recommendations to the City Council regarding land use, review proposed development projects and advise as to the overall development and maintenance of the general plan of the city. And whereas Donald Bradley's distinguished career in the planning field spanned over six 60 years and provided him with an understanding that planning involves the physical, design, social, economic, and political aspects of a whole region, all of which made him an invaluable asset to the Planning Commission. And whereas Donald Bradley led the Planning Commission as chair in 2018 and served as chair of the Residential Design Review Committee for a total of three years, and whereas during his tenure on the Planning Commission, Donald Bradley made vital contributions on some of the most significant projects in the city of San Carlos, including the Eastside Innovation District Vision Plan and Single Family House Size Study, and has helped shape project approvals for key projects, including 626 and 817 Walnut housing developments and new R&D and life science developments at 887 Industrial, 1091 Industrial, and 1030 Britain Avenue. And whereas Donald Bradley's six years of dedicated service as a member of the Planning Commission represents and embodies the San Carlos traditions of volunteerism and service to the community. And whereas Donald Bradley was a great asset on the Planning Commission and will be greatly missed by his staff and his peers. Now therefore be it proclaimed that I, Sarah McDowell, Mayor and... Ethan Mayor. Mm -hmm of the City of San Carlos do hereby express sincere appreciation and thanks to Donald Bradley for his contributions on the Planning Commission and dedication to the community of San Carlos. Thank you, Don. If my wife were here, she would warn you, I'm a big talker, but I'll try to remember her last remarks as I left home today. Don't talk about Senate Bill 9. Uh, if you don't know what that is, I won't tell you. Thank you, council members, staff, the city, other volunteers, hard work, staff, and friends. It's been my honor and my duty to work for these past six years. It went by rather fast, as Ellen and I were saying on the way in. Um, let me, I like quotes. And we have this saying here, as you all know, we're the city of good living. But why can we say that? I think it relates back to 150 years ago, Abraham Lincoln, said at, I don't know if it was Gettysburg or his second inaugural address, um, he came up, he said, we're a government by the people, for the, of the people, by the people, and for the people. And that's one reason I think that we're the city of good living. Jump ahead till about 1960 at John F. Kennedy's second inaugural speech, he said, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And I would say put in city, maybe state or county, or a nonprofit. That all helps. And that's why I, I often say we're the city of good government also. And lastly, I promise, Daniel Burnham said in 1893 in Chicago at the World Exposition there, make no little plans. They have no magic to stir men's blood. Make big plans. 
And that's why I frequently say we're also the city of good planning. Thank you all so much. I love you. Section 5 is Council Communications and Announcements. Council Communications and Announcements are brief items from members of the City Council regarding upcoming events in the community and correspondence that they have received. They are informational in nature and no action will be taken on these items at this meeting. Item 5A is an announcement of the newly appointed... Oh, hold on. We're going to do this. Councilmember Collins. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just uh, a, a couple of a thing. A couple of things. Uh, I attended a uh, uh, LPMG meeting last Thursday. LPMG stands for Local Policymakers Group. It's the Caltrain Electrification Task Force. And at that meeting, um, we heard also from High Speed Rail. And they have been deciding on which uh, track options they're going to choose as they run high-speed rail down the peninsula. One of those options was called Alternative B, and it would have uh, run an additional track or two right through San Carlos. They have decided on a Alternative A, which does not do that. So uh, I would like the residents of San Carlos to know that at least for probably another 20 or 30 years, it will not, it will not be four tracks running through San Carlos. Um, the other thing I would like to um, mention is that uh, one of San Carlos's longest residents, Velma, Kuh uh, Velma Kuhlman, Velma Harding Kuhlman, uh, of 72 years, she lived in San Carlos for 72 years, passed away last Wednesday. She was my mother-in-law, and uh, I thank her for uh, producing my wife so, <laughs> and, my, and subsequently my family. But uh, I was honored to know her, and... Uh, she lived a long and fruitful life. Council Member Dugan. Uh, thank you, Mayor, for the day. And uh, I just have a couple quick things. First, uh, very timely that July is uh, Park and Rec month because uh, we're off to a great start in Park and Rec. Uh, on Friday, I went to the concert in the park and uh, Mustache Harbor uh, really rocked Burden Park. And I'll say, I think there was probably like 2,000 people in the park that night. It was really an amazing turnout. So uh, I would encourage everyone to tune in to our uh, great uh, lineup of concerts in the park. And I understand the uh, movie night, uh, Saturday night, was well attended as well. So we got some good stuff going in the summer. And then secondly, the week before last, I represented San Carlos at the uh, General Assembly of the Association of Barria Governments, and there was a robust discussion on RENA allocations, and uh, um, it, it ended up being a discussion of best practices for the further development of a below market rate housing, and I participated in some of that, but in particular, I mentioned the good work we uh, did recently as a city on preservation of below market rate housing. And and how we recently extended our uh, inclusionary uh, below market rate covenants from previously 45 or 55 years into perpetuity and in that we had done the hard work, uh, Greg and, and his team, to, to discover that we could do that as a city and, and then we did it. And uh, I'll just say that that was well received and uh, there are Prior to that, not a lot of discussion was happening on the preservation of below market rate housing. And I'll just say uh, um, I got uh, feedback from five or six different cities that uh, their leaders are going to definitely take a look at that. So I just uh, want to applaud the leadership we're showing here in San Carlos on affordable housing. Thank you. Vice Mayor Rack. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I had just a few items. One, I just uh, wanted to congratulate and thank all the commissioners for their, their service, and particularly Don, who's here. And I, I would wholeheartedly agree with you, Don. The, it is the citizen engagement that does make us the city of good living, so thank you. Uh, I also attended the Council of Cities dinner on Friday, which is uh, 
monthly gathering of the local elected officials. We met in uh, East Palo Alto and heard about uh, some of the Boys and Girls Club activities around there, but it was a good opportunity. I had a chance to talk to uh, some of the council members from South San Francisco who have in place a child care um, fee right now, so to talk to them is it something we're considering today, so it's, it's a good opportunity to collaborate and get more insight from some of the other cities and, and fellow council members. And then uh, lastly, I, uh, Mayor McDowell and I participated in the 2 plus 2 meeting this uh, week on Friday, which is uh, two city council members and two school board members that we meet on a fairly regular basis. Uh, we talked uh, around a number of issues. I'll let the mayor finish uh, on that, but around enrollment and funding for the school district, that's gonna keep going up and down. Uh, one of the interesting pieces that I think will be relevant to our discussion tonight is there's potentially a state, some changes to state law around uh, transitional kindergarten, which would expand the age range so that there'll be all three-year-olds. So it could impact our child care numbers and an opportunity to partner more with the city, I'm excuse me, with the school district around those, uh, those areas. So I'll turn it over to the mayor to finish. Madam Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I had a wonderful time touring several different city departments with Mayor Eason here, and I wanted to thank our staff for being such wonderful hosts. Um, we had a really great time, and Eason has just been a terrific mayor, so I really enjoyed my time with you. Um, following up on what the vice mayor said, I also wanted to um, report out from the 2 plus 2 meeting that um, Chief Bell and I gave a presentation on um, safety regulations for firearms and the good work that we had done um, as a city and as a council in 2019 to pass several ordinances to require safe storage of firearms, that um, any firearms here in our city have to be stored in a locked container or disabled by a trigger lock. Um, we passed some zoning regulations regulations that govern where firearms retailers could open. Um, and all of this information is posted on the city's website at cityofsancarlos.org slash firearms regulations. So if anyone has questions about what's on the books here in San Carlos, I'm very proud of our council's work and um, we've done quite a bit. Um, and then I had one other um, piece of information that I wanted to share with the public, which is regarding safe routes to school, which we also touched on in our 2 plus 2 meeting. Um, our public works director, Stephen Machida, launched um, a beautiful new webpage at cityofsancarlos.org slash bikepedplan, where there are several safety improvements listed and maps, interactive maps where the public can go in and comment on um, several of the suggested improvements. So it would be great if the public would weigh in over the summer on um, some of those plans. Okay, Eason, I'll turn it back to you. Item 5A is an announcement of the newly appointed Downtown Advisory Committee members. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I have the honor tonight to announce um, we have 17 new members of our Downtown Advisory Committee, um, which was established to be an advisory body to the City Council as we reimagine the Laurel Street Corridor. So those members are Allison Chang and Tom Davids, representing downtown property owners, Ali Board and Donna Lira as downtown business operators, Anthony Cam, Economic Development Advisory Commission member, Jean Daner um, as an older adult representative from the Adult Community Center, Mark's, Mark Maxwell from the Parks, Recreation and Culture Commission, Amy Buckmaster is a representative from Chamber San Mateo County, Madison Blanton is uh, the special needs uh, community, we have Joaquin Pedrin, Sri Shandrashek, Gron, Elisa Espinosa and Monette Meredith at large members, Maya Nayberg and Samina Ginwala from the Youth Advisory Council, and Elizabeth Min, Cecile Lee, James Bertram, and Tracy Massaro as alternates. So I'm um, really excited about that work getting underway and I want to thank um, everyone. We had almost 100 people um, apply. We interviewed, I think, 41 different members of the public um, and I really appreciated the interest from the public and um, looking forward to hearing from them soon. Back to you, Mr. Mayor. Does council, have, does council have any other announcements to make? Council member didn't. 
Yeah, thank you, uh, Mayor, for the day. And I, I just, uh, I was remiss. I, I also just want to briefly thank Don Bradley for all of his long uh, career of public service, not just on our planning commission, but this goes all the way back to his service in the Air Force as a young man and truly a lifetime of service. And uh, Don was the chair of the planning commission when I joined the planning commission back in 2018. And he was just very generous with his time and with his experience and uh, really did help me get up to speed quickly. And uh, and I know firsthand he had a lot of uh, very solid impact to our various um, uh, uh, planning ordinances and, and projects in town. So thank you, Don. Really appreciate that personally. Now we will take public comments on public comments on items not posted on the agenda. Each speaker is limited to to two minutes. If the item you're speaking is not listed on the agenda, please be advised that the city council may briefly, briefly respond to statements made or questions posed as allowed under the Round Act. The city council's general policy is to refer items to staff for attention or have a matter placed on a future city council agenda for more comprehensive action or report and formal public discussion and input at all at that time. Crystal, is there anyone wishing to speak? Yes, Mr. Mayor, we do have one person uh, in the chambers, uh, Laura Deck. If you can approach the podium, please. Um, to the mayor and mayor for the day and council members and San Carlos residents here tonight, good evening. Um, my name is Laura Deck and I'm a 30 year San Carlos resident. I raised my children here and they attended Arundel, TL and Carlmont. On May 21st, I attended the Hometown Days Parade with my boyfriend, John, and how wonderful it was to see the various schools, clubs and bands after the long pandemic hiatus. My children marched in the parade as members of the TL Band, 4-H and Scouts, and it's a wonderful family and community event. At the end of the parade, however, I was disturbed to see members of the San Mateo County Sheriff's Office marching in full camouflage fatigues and carrying assault rifles. There was absolutely no need for the display of these dangerous weapons, and given the recent mass shootings in Buffalo and Uvalde, it was entirely inappropriate and tone deaf for the officers to showcase those weapons, especially in the presence of children. I felt extremely uneasy and the show of force diminished what was a joyful celebration of community spirit. It's no secret that many San Carlos residents are unhappy with the ability of the San Mateo County Sheriff's Office to keep our community safe from crime. Just read next door. <laughs> it's safe to say that the reputation of the Sheriff's Office is in need of improvement. The parade could have been an opportunity for the officers to increase trust and goodwill by handing out candy or stickers to the children instead of flashing high-powered weapons. I realized the parade organizers, many of whom are volunteers, and city representatives may not have had a say in the sheriff's office participation, but someone should have spoken up. I emailed my concerns to the sheriff's office, the Hometown Days parade organizers, and the San Carlos City Clerk, but did not receive a response from any of these groups. Ms. So, Beck, I'm sorry, your, your two minutes are, are wrapping up, if okay, you don't I'm mind. One final sure. sentence. Yeah. Um, I call upon the San Carlos City Council to ban assault rifles from next year's Hometown Days Parade. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, and I'll just ask that staff follow up, please. Thank you. Okay, go ahead, Eason. Is there, you wanna ask? If Crystal, is there any more people wishing to speak? Yes, we do have one hand uh, from Zoom. Daniel Villasenor, if you can go ahead and unmute. Hello, everyone can hear me? Yes, thank you. Um, hi guys, my name is Daniel Villasenor. I've been a San Carlos resident for 21 years of my life. And this Saturday, I'm throwing a music festival in Burton Park. 
been a long time coming and I'm really excited for it. It's going to be a, a bunch of acts from the Silicon Valley performing and then artists will be showcasing their work at the park. I've been promoting it for like the past month and I think it's going to be a really cool time to see some youth musicians and youth creatives all together in one place. Um, yeah, it'll be July 2nd, 4 to 9. Um, hope you guys can come through. It'll be a great time. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Daniel. And there are no further hands. At this point, I think our mayor for the day gets to retire. Is that right, Crystal? Okay. Mayor Eason, thank you so much. You did a great job. Thank you again, Eason. You did a terrific job. Okay, we will now move on to item seven, the consent calendar. Do any of my colleagues wish to pull an item from consent? Um, Madam Mayor, I'm trying to find the item because you have so many here. Uh, no, I don't see it. Okay, sorry. <laughs> since we went through almost the whole alphabet. Uh, on letter K, uh, I'm going to recuse myself from that vote since I live within 500 feet of Burton Park. Okay, noted. Any other items? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion. Sorry, through the chair. Just want to um, clarify that item K, there's two resolutions. Uh, we broke out the, the so if you want to uh, recuse yourself from just the Flanagan, we can do that. Sure, that'd okay. be great. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a motion? Madam Mayor, I'll move to approve City Council consent calendar items A through U. Second. In W. Oh, yeah. Do you like to amend that to W, please? You're not getting off that easy, John. You got to read those. <laughs> you got it right. Fair enough. I withhold my second. <laughs> <laughs> I will move to approve City Council consent calendar items A through U and item V, adopting ordinance number 1583, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of San Carlos amending municipal code chapter 18 to adjust the city density bonus inclusionary housing requirements, affordability periods, parking for affordable units, and making other conforming amendments, and item W, adopting ordinance number 1584, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of San Carlos, amending San Carlos Municipal Code Title 18 zoning, consisting of modifications to Chapter 18.23.210, accessory dwelling units, junior accessory dwelling units. Second. Crystal, could you please call the roll? Councilmember Dugan? Yes. Councilmember Collins? Yes. Councilmember Farmer Lohan? Yes. Uh, Vice Mayor Rack? Yes, with the exception of the Flanagan Field lights. Um, okay. And Mayor McDowell? Yes. Thank you, Crystal. Okay, we'll move on to item eight, reports to council. We will receive a presentation from Cal Water on drought updates. Good evening, Madam Mayor, City Council Member Stephen Machida, Public Works Director. So what's before you tonight is really kind of drought presentation. So as we all are aware, the area is really experiencing a drought, um, another drought this year. So staff thought it would be a great opportunity for the City Council to receive a report from Cal Water on the status of the drought. So tonight we have Ross Molian, Cal Water's Space Shore District Manager, and Anthony Meyer, Cal Water's Water Conservation Coordinator here to actually present uh, or make the presentation. So I'll turn it over to Ross. So just, thank okay. you. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Vice Mayor, City Council, staff, and the community of San Carlos. Really appreciate the privilege to be here and provide an update on a topic that's uh, probably on most minds of everybody that lives in California. That is the drought, and our focus tonight is really the drought, water use restrictions, and conservation. 
I'm the district manager, Ross Moylan, here in the Bayshore District. Uh, Mike Oots is our assistant district manager who's here in the audience. Anthony Meyer will be assisting me on the presentation tonight. He's our water conservation coordinator. And Robert Seeley, who's our regional community affairs specialist. So the Bayshore District, we serve as a whole uh, approximately 201,000 people through 54,000 connections. And in San Carlos, we have nearly 11,000 service connections that we serve here, population roughly around 30,000 people. Um, the system of San Carlos is often referred to as Mid-Peninsula. It's kind of a legacy name associated also with San Mateo. But for the purpose of our presentation, we will be, of course, focusing on San Carlos. We monitor our supply conditions on a daily basis. So we have professionals that do that on, on really looking at supply reliability, the drought situation, and also really supply from a standpoint of when we're not in drought conditions. This slide that you see up here isn't a slide to create panic or scare you. It's the reality. Uh, you may have seen this uh, on the news. I saw this actually on the news this morning, as a matter of fact, really representing our state and the conditions we have from a drought standpoint. Uh, nearly 98% of the state is now in a severe to exceptional drought conditions. Um, this has been an ongoing concern, particularly highlighted last year and into this year. I'm going to go through a timeline of some different things that have happened throughout the state, uh, some governor act uh, some actions taken from the state level with Governor Newsom actually in May 10th, this is of last year, issuing a proclamation of declaring the, the, the drought uh, a state of emergency. Uh, again, this was last year. Um, June 9th, later that year, I uh, called on water agencies to develop water shortage contingency plans, which we did. We followed ours later in June 15th with the California uh, Public Utilities Commission who were regulated by. And July 8th, the uh, governor uh, issued an executive order calling for a 15% reduction, right? So that's a number that we'll talk a little bit more about tonight. On July 14th, uh, we received approval to implement our stage one, which we did of the contingency plan. Moving into October 9th uh, of last year, uh, Governor Newsom actually expanded the drought emergency statewide. Some of the more recent developments that we've seen, um, we filed our, our stage two of our water supply contingency plan for the Mid-Peninsula and South San Francisco systems. Those are the systems we actually do serve as a whole in the Bayshore District. And those are now approved, uh, which include prohibited uses and irrigation uh, and restrictions that you'll hear a little bit more later from Anthony about. The goal of the 15% reduction, and really what you see from this slide is if you look, and this is again for San Carlos, back in March, we were actually, and this is comparing usage in 2020 compared to 2021, you see 7.4% in March, um, and if an increase, 4.9% uh, in April. Obviously a little bit concerning where we're being asked to, to reach a 15% uh, target level. But what you see in May, you see a 11% reduction. A lot more communication, community presentations, um, bill messages, different things that we've done for outreach really seems to have kind of triggered some behavior changes. When you look at the month of May, that's a time where you actually start seeing people irrigating more outdoor, the weather's starting to change, but instead we're actually seeing um, the residents in San Carlos and, and businesses actually use less. It's not at the 15%, but what we're really seeing there is encouraging results in the month of May, and we expect to see that continue. This is, uh, again, kind of a slide that kind of captures that in a little bit different way, and that's really kind of your total production by month. And if you look there, you can see in 2020 uh, the dark the dark bluer line of how we were doing from a total production by month. And if you look at beginning this year, you can see we're actually starting, as I mentioned, above that line, which we didn't want to see. But you can see the trending now uh, from April to May is heading in a direction that we're looking for, which is very encouraging. I'm gonna leave this slide up. Anthony's gonna talk a little bit more about this and the prohibited uses that we have in effect. Anthony? Thank you for the opportunity, Council. Um, so just with the slide up and looking at the trend that we have, uh, we're, we're excited to start seeing this kind of a trend and we're hoping that that trajectory can continue going in the months as we continue to implement stage two of our water shortage contingency plan and also see more and more engagement with our, our customer base with the programs that we're rolling out. 
One of the things we've been doing a lot of in recent months is we've been trying to make sure that people are aware of the prohibited uses of water that have already been in place. Um, a lot of people were not aware that these were already in place. And so we do like to always, you know, through public outreach, we've been doing a lot of public presentations. We've been doing inserts, uh, bill mailers, email blasts, things like that to kind of just make sure people are aware of what's already been in place and then also uh, keep them abreast of what we have as we've moved into stage two of our contingency plan. Probably the most notable change as we have moved into uh, stage two of our plan in the Bayshore District is the irrigation day restrictions um, and the watering days. So for all of our Bayshore District customers now, they're reduced to doing two days a week that they can water and not between the hours of 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. And this is based off of the ending number of your street address of your residence or your business. Um, one of the things I would like to point out with this is that the reason why we see a lot of emphasis put on irrigation day restrictions and watering days, things of that sort, is because we now know that 60 to 80 percent of uh, domestic water use is applied toward outdoor use, so watering, irrigation. So these are where we tend to see the biggest footprint and the, the you know, most significant impact when it comes to you know, trying to meet our 15 percent reduction goals. Now there are some, in stage two of our contingency plan, there are some exceptions to the irrigation day restrictions. And we do always like to try to make sure people are aware of this because if you're hand watering um, or if you have landscape or irrigation zones that are using drip irrigation or micro spray, those are actually not confined to the watering day schedule. And so, you know, for customers that have large areas of landscape that does use overhead spray, one of our big things right now is reaching out to those customers to see if there's um, a possibility that they could change the system over and irrigate through drip irrigation. And the main emphasis for this is so that we can keep trees alive, you know, things like that, instead of just, you know, seeing everything die as a whole if they're cutting off irrigation. Um, and in addition to that, adjustments and repairs to the irrigation systems, those can be done outside of the watering days or the times. Uh, another significant thing as we moved into stage two of our contingency plan, the CPUC has authorized us to imp impose penalties should the need arise. Um, obviously our first um, mode of attack is we're, we're always gonna reach out to the customer first. We're gonna try to educate them. Nine times out of 10 when we do come across somebody that has um, watered on the wrong day, it's just a matter of them not knowing or not being aware of what the irrigation day restrictions are. So through our customer centers, we tend to just reach out or we leave a door hanger and we let them know, hey, this is the days that you should be watering. And in most cases that actually corrects the, the situation. Um, if for some reason that doesn't and it continues to be a reoccurring thing, the PUC has authorized us to do for a second violation, a $50 penalty. For a third violation, that could result in a $100 penalty, and that can be on a per day basis if needed. And then for fourth and more egregious violations, which are you know obviously intentional, um, they have authorized us to install a flow restricting device on the customer's meter. Um, not something we ever, we ever want to see, but again, you know, we, we tend to, in the past, we've always reached our goals strictly through outreach and communication for the most part with our customers. These are more in place for you know the bad kids, if you will. So one of the really big things that we're doing right now is we have severely ramped up and rolled out a very robust series of conservation programs and rebates. In many cases, we've actually as much as doubled our rebate amounts just to try to capture those people that maybe were on the fence about you know, doing some of these types of programs. Um, Obviously, we do put emphasis on inside things like clothes washers that are high efficiency, uh, high efficiency toilets. But again, we, you know, obviously we know where the, the footprint is, is outdoors. So we try to put a lot of our attention into that. And those programs we have ramped up severely uh, with our lawn to garden and spray to drip program. Uh, we have these programs available to our commercial customers as well as residential customers. Um, we have seen a lot in the last two months, I would say just being somebody behind the scenes that sees how, how the engagement goes with these, we've really seen a lot of this ramp up and a lot of engagement with our customers as they've you know started to become more and more aware of what's available to them. Um, 
probably one of the most significant ones right now, and obviously it kind of goes hand in hand with the CIA requirements of not watering uh, or non-functional turf, um, is our lawn to garden and spray to drip programs. So for this one, if somebody's willing to re remove turf and do some uh, drought tolerant landscaping, we've actually upped that rebate amount to $3 per square foot with an additional 50 cents per square foot if they are retrofitting their existing overhead spray sprinklers into a drip irrigation system. So there's a total of $3.50 a square foot available now for those customers, and that is for commercial as well as residential. Uh, another really cool program that we're getting a lot of engagement with is our Smart Landscape Tune-Up Program. This is completely free uh, to our customers. Um, basically, in a nutshell, what this entails is we have a contract with the landscape contractor, Valley Soil. A uh, customer can sign up for this within just a couple minutes on our website, and we will actually send that contractor to the customer's home or business, and they do a very thorough evalu evaluation of their existing irrigation system. Um, if they note that there's breaks, repairs that need to be done, or just like severe amount of work that would bring that up to speed so it's the most high efficient that it possibly can be. Uh, they schedule a second appointment to go back out to that home or business. They perform all those repairs completely free of charge to the customer. Um, they actually do all the work and they send us the bill and we pick up the tab for it. So as you can imagine, this has become uh, quite popular since we rolled it out recently. And last but not least, then, as, as always, we do have our conservation kits. This, again, is another free program for all of Cal Water customers. Uh, they can sign up for this on our website, and we send them this box of conservation goodies that they can, for the most part, everybody can install themselves in their home. It's got high-efficient shower heads. It's got faucet aerators. It has a little tablet kit to check out uh, your toilets and see if they have any kind of leaks that go unnoticed, typically. And it also comes with a garden hose sprayer that shuts itself off when you're done using it. And as always, we always uh, recommend people go to our website. Um, we keep this updated on a regular basis, and any news that, that there is that comes up with regard to the drought or any new conservation programs that we do roll out, uh, we keep that current. So it's a really good place for people to go and look. And that's it. I thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation. I, I learned a lot. Um, I'll open it up to questions from my colleagues. Councilmember Collins. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and, and thank you, gentlemen, for a great uh, presentation. I had the opportunity to go visit the Hetch Hetchy Reservoir a few weeks ago, and it was extremely educational. And the, it was the, the strong message was that we all need to conserve, even though that dam, you know, was quite full. Um, but I, a couple questions I have, and this question comes up, seems like every time we go into a drought, I have residents who say to me, well, if we have this these, this severe drought, why are we still building? Uh, why are we building anything, you know, new housing, new construction at all, if we have this extreme drought? How would you suggest that we answer that question? It's a great question. Um, I think probably the, the, the best way to answer it, or one of the best ways to answer it, is to talk about that, you know, projects aren't going to get approved, large projects, until we take a good look as, as a community, uh, the city, uh, water supplier, to ensure the water is in place. Thankfully, we haven't run into a situation where that has been a no. Um, we've definitely been working on some of the challenges associated, one with the drought, limited supply in the future, on ensuring that there is adequate supply. And one one of the things that we're doing is trying to add to the water supply portfolio to ensure that growth, if a city wants to grow, is not stopped because of water supply. Um, but those challenges are not easy challenges to get over. There's cost. We want to make sure that uh, the cost is fair and that we've done feasibility studies on those options to make sure that whatever options we decide to move forward with, um, they're the smartest option. And, and that's definitely something we've been working on. And we don't work on it just, just in times of drought. It's something that we work on in times when there's not a drought um, because we know that is a future concern. And we live in California where drought has been historically a problem for us and anticipate it will in the future as well. Thank you. I, I also got the, the question uh, recently that uh, our water usage, because our population has increased over the last, and I'm not just talking about San Carlos, but the county in general, that our water usage, or our, because our residents have increased, or population has increased, that our water usage has, has increased. I did talk with a, 
a member um, who's on, I think it's, I forget but how you pronounce the Ackerman, but it's like Baxa or something Bosca. like that. Bosca. Bosca, thank you. Uh, he's a council member in Sunnyvale. He said he had seen um, a report not long ago that said that even though there had been a population increase in Santa Clara County of 20% or whatever it was over the last 10 to 15 years, that the water usage had been relatively flat. And, and I'm wondering, is that... Is that true of uh, San Mateo County? And if it is, uh, is there a way that we can access that information that we could share with our constituents? We can definitely share information that we have from a standpoint of what Cal Water provides and, and maybe even be able to give some additional information on the county. I think there's definitely some truth in the situation that we've seen from the last drought that we had um, back in you know, 2014, 15, 16 that was pretty significant that we all remember. Um, and behavior hasn't completely gone back to what it was before that, which is encouraging. Um, people definitely learned from that situation and haven't resumed. And I think people made a lot of changes to their landscaping and different things like that. So I think, I think there is somewhat some truth in that, in that statement. The other thing that we're seeing, and you mentioned development earlier, is in some cases, sometimes development, depending on what's going in a location or a parcel, could actually use less water than what's there now. So in some cases, development can actually include uh, more efficiency, uh, less outdoor landscaping and things of that nature, which a lot of cities like yourself also encourage. So um, it's definitely something important. So I, I think that is definitely true in some, in some areas, maybe not uh, holistically though. Thank you, and, and thank you for the, the links um, for water saving. I'm gonna make sure that I put that on my Facebook page. Great. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Uh, let's see. We'll go to Council Member Dugan and then Vice Mayor Rack and then Council Member Permer Lohan. Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. And uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, good presentation. I, I too learned a lot. And uh, um, and I would say in particular, I'm uh, planning to sign up for your uh, smart landscape tune-up program. That, that seems like a good one. And. Uh, and uh, Jeff, I would say that's a good candidate for the city newsletter, uh, maybe uh, emphasizing the irrig irrigation day restrictions and then uh, that tune-up, uh, advertise that out to our folks. Um, and then, uh, so my question though is, um, you, know, I, you know, hopefully this does it, and I know we've made some progress uh, as, a, as a water district on conservation, but if this drought continues, you know, things will likely get even tighter. Um, and could you just uh, explain what the enforcement mechanism is? Is it, are you monitoring for usage that exceeds the average or, you know, you're waiting for people to um, uh, report someone they think is over water? Like, you know, can you just take me through what the enforcement mechanism's like? And I, I am glad that, you know, you start out with warnings and relatively minor fees before it gets more serious. But I just kind of want to understand what that regime will look like uh, if we do end up, you know, in a, a more severe drought. Let Anthony take that one. Yeah, for Anthony. sure. Um, so pretty much the way that we have that structured right now is um, we have several different systems for reporting water waste. Um, it can be done on an anonymous basis uh, through our website or, or they could contact our customer center. Um, for us, the biggest aspect of that is we have to put eyes on it. We can't go off of hearsay and things like that. So uh, the turnaround is crucial as far as responding to these things. And, and now that we have online reporting and phone calls starting to come in, we have to kind of weed through those and make sure they're not angry neighbor disputes and things like that so that we can you know, try to settle them accordingly. Um, First, first order of business with it though is obviously trying to see if we can get a, one of our field staff to go out and put eyes on it or witness it while it's in the, you know, being done in the act. And at that point, uh, we would either try to knock on the door, talk to the customer. In most cases, it would re result in leaving a door hanger or something just so we can notate that we actually did something physically to try to notify the customer. Um, as we move into more serious stages of that, um, like a second violation through fourth violations or egregious violations, um, those fines are done in the form of um, sort of a surcharge in the billing system. So it's not like we're writing a physical ticket to somebody. Um, you know, those we have to document those, and you know, there's obviously a huge paper trail that has to occur for us to make sure that we validate validate any type of uh, enforcement actions. But that is kind of what that looks like in in, in the form of um, a surcharge on their bill. Okay. All right. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah. Vice Mayor Rack. 
Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thanks for the presentation. It was helpful as well. I'm going to be sharing the links. Um, the question, I, you didn't, and I'm curious if and this wasn't touched on at all, is I know some communities are using recycled water. Um, can you touch a little, like, what would be the process to do that? How, is that something you help support or, or do or help create? Or how, if St. Carlos wanted to participate in something like that, how would something like that happen? Well, at a high level, um, those are some of the projects I was referencing that we're looking at. Um, recycled water is, it's around us today. It's being util utilized by other communities, uh, certainly. So it's definitely something that is definitely on our radar and has been for a while. And it's not just one particular project. It's actually several in the area um, on the peninsula. And what I mentioned to you earlier about, you know, how do we go about putting that together? It's really kind of that aspect of kind of the feasibility. What makes the most sense? Is it a combination of more than one project or is it one big project that we that we implement the distribution system that's necessary to provide that water um, that, that recycled water it has to be a separate system there's a lot of conditions that go along with that um, you probably heard of the purple pipe system and and that basically is something that's very common particularly in areas I've worked at in the past like in Southern California so it's definitely something doable and possible and we may see that here in the near future hard to say for sure we're still kind of at the stages of trying to decide what makes the, the most sense for our customers, what's the most um, sense from a cost standpoint as well, and the reliability factor, and also the, the amount that it produces. So those are some significant projects that are in play, um, and they're not new. Um, they're, it's not like a brand new concept or something new in the area. It's, it's been ongoing, and uh, it's, it's very possible. Great. No, I appreciate that. I, I think it's... A useful exercise from the standpoint of, I mean, we keep hearing that this this is not going to go away. It's not going to, you know, maybe we'll have some reprieve here and there, but long term, it seems like a good potential solution. Obviously, you have to figure out the make it work and the infrastructure and the costs and everything else. But uh, I appreciate that you're you're looking into it. Yeah, and we and we would certainly not be doing that uh, behind closed doors with uh, with the city of San Carlos or any cities we serve, and we'd be working with you guys together and probably through some workshops and different planning groups to make sure that uh, people's concerns about that are addressed and questions and different different ideas that they might have. Great, thank you, Council Me Council Member Palmer Lohan. Great, thank you. I appreciate it, and thank you for the presentation. This is a conversation I've been wanting to have for a long time. I know uh, many people are concerned um, about the prolonged drought and building on Vice Mayor Rack's um, you know, question around uh, recycling. Um, what I'm curious about, it, and I'm thinking about, I had the good fortune to um, travel to Hawaii many years ago on the main island, and there's an entire community that's built on uh, a very dry side of the island uh, that gets virtually no rain <laughs> during the year. And they have a very elaborate uh, water capture system um, and um, and are able to live a very viable uh, life um, on that side of the island. And I'm just wondering, um, you know, it's, it's sounding to me like we're at the point where maybe we need to start thinking differently about um, how we think about our water infrastructure. And, you know, to your point about um, having some initial conversations and ideas around recycling, um, where are we in that that long term uh, visioning uh, planning uh, with Cal Water with respect to uh, water capture? Um, Office of Sustainability, for example, has been offering barrels on a pilot basis. Um, you can get them in different sizes, uh, but it does take some knowledge and know how to um, cobble these solutions together. And I'm just curious, um, you know, do we need to be um, more? I'm feeling like we need to be more proactive um, about our future state with respect to how we uh, capture our water and, and uh, recycle and reuse it. And I'm just wondering, kind of where is the conversation with respect to, to Cal Water on this? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a great question. And I think the, the, the perfect answer is we've been doing this for a long time. We've always been assessing recycled water, looking at different water sources, and trying to find that balance between what is fair for the ratepayers to pay and the most cost-effective sourcing of water. And so as that moves into different phases, as technology improves and as new infrastructure comes out, we move forward. So we're working on different plans and exploring different avenues behind what those scenarios might look like going into the next you know, 10, 20, 30 years, as well as what's happening in the immediate future um, to try and satisfy the needs of growth 
of reliability and, and sustainability and, and kind of all of those things coming in. So it is happening. It is a conversation we're happening. We recently met with city staff here to have a partial conversation about that. We're going to continue to, to go forward with exploring these possibilities and working them into our plans in the future. Great. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'm glad yeah. to hear. Okay, thank you, Councilmember Member Palmer-Lohan. I have a couple of questions as well. Um, and actually, they were brought to my attention from a, a resident, so I'm going to um, pass them along and hopefully um, we can get some answers tonight. Um, the first is, has CalWater investigated installing smart meters like PG&E um, to allow real-time updates for users on their water use? And building on the PG&E analogy, um, we all get, you know, these, um, updates in the mail from PG&E um, comparing our homes to similar sized homes and do you have kind of a program like that in place where where residents can maybe find a more complete picture of how how they rate and then how they compare to other other um, residences in San Carlos so thankfully a lot of yeses to those um, first of all yeah from a smart meter uh, which we often refer to uh, one of the common uh, acronyms is AMI meter infrastructure is definitely something we're piloting now uh, we definitely uh, hope to expand that uh, much broader uh, here in the near future um, something that we will submit in our uh, infrastructure improvement plan and we have been uh, which is why we're actually in a pilot phase right now so I, I think it's safe to say that you're going to see more of that in the in the future in all of the communities that we serve. As far as the water use comparison, I'm going to let Anthony talk a little bit about that. Um, Could you refresh me on what the water use comparison? Oh, sure. So, um, so PG&E um, sends, I, I think we all get them in the statements that says, here's your usage for the month and here's how you compare to homes of similar size. And you get like a happy face or, or it goes, goes down from there. Right. So if you're like super, a big user of power, then... Get the gold star. Yeah, right. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. we, we actually are doing a similar program to that. It's a, the gold star looks a little bit more different, but um, what we're doing is because our conservation goals are obviously trying to meet that 50 15% reduction in, in comparison to 2020 usage. So in our bills now, they're starting to reflect where we're showing somebody what their, if they were at the address in 2020, it's showing what the comparison was for that parcel. Um, hopefully we don't get into the uh, stage three type of situation, but if we ever should, where budgets and things like that become into uh, more into play, um, obviously those will be more based on the parcel size and what the you know, you know figurative usage, projected usage for that parcel would entail. And it would give people kind of a, a red to green scale of where they're sitting every month on a month to month basis. Um, in addition to that, one of the things that we've, we were actually trying to make a little more um, user friendly is we, we do our billing in reportables of CCFs. So a lot of people get their bills and they see that and they're like, well, I don't know what a CCF is and they don't know how to do the math. Uh, so we are looking at kind of making more layman's terms involved in our billing to where people can see, okay, what does this mean? This means how many gallons? We try to have some of that show in the bills where people can say, oh, wow, because, you know, a CCF, it sounds like it's a one, it's a one unit. You know, what does that mean? Well, it's 748 gallons of water. That's a lot of water. So when you see it on a more, uh, layman's term type scale, it, it tends to make people think a little more and kind of get a better grasp on what that looks like as far as their actual home water use or business water use. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I agree with layman's terms. I think that's really helpful. Um, if I could do a little, just a, a side answer to the, uh, uh, the first question. Um, in the areas that we don't have AMI technology already available to customers, and like like he said, we're we're trying to implement that, and it's on a you know an, an as need basis, obviously, because there's several, there's a lot of costs involved. Uh, that trickles down to the ratepayers. What we are doing to offset that right now, we did just do a pilot program with Flume Technologies, and it's it's a similar type of technology, but it's a retrofit. So it's a device that can just Velcro onto a customer's meter, and it can supply the same type of data sets to them, and they can get notifications of, you know, if it looks like there's maybe a leak happening because the meter's turned for a, a long period of time. So it is the same technology, but it's a retrofit, and uh, we are making those available. I think we are, the, the device typically costs about $200, and in our pilot program, we are doing an instant, uh, I think it's 75% rebate, so it ends up costing about $50, um, and they get that at the point of sale, too. So they are limited because it is a pilot program, so there's only so many in each district, but if we start to see that be impactful and get good feedback from the customer base, we're going to try to magnify that and obviously make it more available. Thank you. I have one last question. Um, she's wondering, um, regarding the assignment of water days, um, 
it seems like that's still kind of open to abuse because someone could just water a whole lot on those two days. So um, has there been any talk about giving a, a property owner an allotment of gallons to use and then they can kind of see how that is managed and if they go way over or, or if they're cutting back and going under? It, that that's a very good question, um, and kind of what I touched on a second ago, that is that is part of what we would look at if we were to ever move into stage three, where we do have allotments and things like that, where we're having to measure those on a parcel basis. Um, as far as like right now in stage two, we're not really giving people, you know, per capita use caps that they can, they have to stay within. Um, but at the same time, the way our billing structure is, when we see high use that's in comparisons to prior months or even prior years, uh, we do have a very proactive outreach approach as far as reaching out to customers and just letting them know, hey, you know, this month it looks like you used a lot more water than you did this same time last year. Um, and we have found that a lot of those communications do are impactful. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see no further questions, so I will open it up to public comment. If you're participating remotely by Zoom, you may raise your hand at this time. Or if you're here joining us in person, you may fill out a speaker card. Crystal, is there any public comment this evening? I, I do not have any speaker cards and there are no hands raised on Zoom. Okay, well thank you all very much for joining us this evening. It was very informative, thank you. Okay, we will now move on to item nine, new business, consideration of adopting a resolution, approving and adopting the child care impact fee nexus study prepared by Economic and Planning Systems, Inc. for the city of San Carlos dated July 14th, 2021. So Judy. Hello, um, well, all right, we'll get started as soon as we see a full screen there. Good evening, Mayor, City Council, and San Carlos community. My name is Sajudi Hawk, and I'm the Senior Management Analyst for the Community Development Department. And tonight I will be doing two presentations related to childcare, along with our consultant and a principal with Economic and Planning Systems, Inc., Ashley Cannett. The first presentation, which will be fairly brief, um, is on the approving and adopting the Child Care Impact Fee Nexus Study. The Child Care Impact Fee Nexus Study was prepared by EPS and completed in January 2020 and then updated in July 2021. The preparation of the Nexus Study was part of the City Council's effort to address child care shortage in the city. EPS developed the technical analysis and prepared the required Nexus Study to support potential implementation of a child care development impact fee. It is important to note that the city currently has several development impact fees, none of which is child care. The Nexus study provides legal context, assumptions, child care facility cost estimates, fee calculations, and program implementation and administration, basically acting as a guide on how to properly implement and administer a child care impact fee program. The Nexus study establishes the maximum development impact fee based on demographic, employment, and land use assumptions, uh, justifiable, justifiable under the Mitigation Fee Act that could be required for new developments within the city. The study found a nexus between the impact of development and the need for childcare in San Carlos, and the maximum fee is proportionate to the impact. During the public hearing item, which is coming up next, staff and consultant will deep dive into the impact fee amounts. However, before council can adopt an ordinance implementing a child care impact fee, it is required that the Nexus study is adopted as well. I will clarify that if council chooses not to move forward with the upcoming ordinance implementing a child care impact fee, it is still okay to adopt the Nexus study tonight. With that, I will end the brief presentation on the Nexus study with staff recommendation to approve and adopt the Child Care Impact v. Nexus study prepared by EPS for the city dated July 14, 2021. I'm here to answer any questions you may have along with our Housing and Economic Development Manager, Adam Aronson, our CDD Director, Al Save, and our consultant, Ashley. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sajudi. Any questions from council? Vice Mayor Beck. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Sajudi. And uh, thanks for the presentation and for the work on the study. Um, I don't have any 
sort of concerns about anything. I'm just, my question is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we, at the two plus two meeting, they talked about some changes potentially in state, I don't know if it would be state law or some, some of the regulations around um, transitional kindergarten that might change some of the impact and the numbers, uh, uh, the, sort of the impact on what the needs are in our community. Is there, and this may be a question that might be better for the next discussion, but is that have any impact potentially on the on the fee structure that would be recommended or how that might impact that if all of a sudden, you know, we only need half as many slots because now the school district is taking half of them because of the changes in the law. Sure, I'll have our consultant answer <clears throat> that. Thank you, good evening, this is Mashley Cannett. Um, I heard you reference that earlier and I started thinking, how am I gonna answer that question when it comes <laughs> I up? I gave so, you the little preview. <laughs> I did, I appreciate it. Um, I think that um, if we were looking potentially at an impact fee on residential development, I would say yes, I would actually wanna go back and take another look at that. Um, but we are, if, if you go down the path of thinking about an impact fee program tonight, I think we're just looking at non-residential development. The basis for that nexus tonight was a survey that was conducted of businesses in San Mateo County that have childcare facilities on site and a survey was conducted looking at, of all the employees working here on site, how many of these employees are taking advantage of the on-site childcare. And that survey found that 4% of employees take advantage of on-site childcare. So it's a very different approach to establishing that nexus. We didn't look at the, um, on the non-residential side, we didn't look at the same demographic factors. So I would say um, no. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, seeing none, uh, Crystal, is there any public comment? I, I am not seeing any hands and I do not have any speaker cards for this item. Okay, is there any further discussion on this item? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion. Madam Mayor, I move to adopt resolution, uh, I move to adopt uh, a resolution 2022-77. A resolution of the City Council of the City of San Carlos approving and adopting the Child Care Impact Fee Nexus Study prepared by Economic and Planning Systems, Inc. for the City of San Carlos dated July 14th, 2021. Is there a second? Second. Crystal, could you please call the roll? Vice Mayor Rack? Yes. Councilmember Dugan? Yes. Councilmember Collins? Yes. Councilmember Palmer Lohan? Yes. And Mayor McDowell? Yes. Okay, thank you. We will now move on to item 10A, consideration of introducing an ordinance adding chapter 8.52 to the San Carlos Municipal Code, establishing a child care development impact fee for new non-residential developments in the city of San Carlos. And we have Sajuti again. Good evening again, I'm back. Um, so we will move right into the next child care item, um, which is a public hearing to introduce an ordinance adding chapter 8.52 to the code, establishing a child care impact fee um, that will you know, be applied for new non-residential developments in the city. This meeting will focus on three items, which are the development impact fee program parameters, potential use of revenues and actions and next steps. Now, before we jump into the development impact fee, staff really wanted to highlight all of the achievements City Council has accomplished to date to remove, to remove regulatory barriers related to childcare. Last year, several municipal code updates were made, including removing minor use permit requirements for commercial childcare centers in specific zoning districts. The outdoor space requirements were removed. Staff level review for pickup and drop off places were allowed, um, allowing minor use permits Permit requirements for parking non-compliance and updated hours of operation. Finally, other sections uh, were also updated to ensure compliance with state law for small and large family in-home daycares. Now, the goal of these municipal code updates is to make it easier for operators to either expand or start new child care facilities. In addition, earlier this year, staff launched a new city webpage with information and resources for parents and operators, child care advocates, and the community at large. So be sure to check it out at cityofsancarlos.org slash childcare. 
Now moving on from the regulatory achievements to the goals and recommendations for tonight's ordinance. The goals are to create new childcare spaces and improve access to childcare. Staff has been working with the child care subcommittee for the last few years on developing the impact fee parameters and shared the findings with the full council earlier this year at the March study session. The recommendation would be to adopt, adopt the ordinance establishing a child care development impact fee that would only be applied to new non-residential developments and include an on-site option. We will deep dive into the recommendations shortly, and I will now hand it off to Ashley from EPS, who will present the data on the impact fees, briefly touch on the potential use of revenues, and provide more details on the build on site option. I haven't been in an in-person meeting in two years. I have to relearn all the remotes. Um, Ashley Cannett with EPS. Thank you for having me here tonight. Um, next slide, please. Oh, I'm going to do it. I'm sorry. I'm going to learn. Thank you. Um, so what are development impact fees? They're one-time charges on new development. As Sajudi just mentioned, they're authorized by state statute, specifically the Mitigation Fee Act. They're set according to Nexus logic, um, which establishes what we call a reasonable relationship with, between new development and the impacts of new development. Um, as Sajudi just mentioned, they can only be used to fund capital projects. They're really not for maintenance or operations. So we're really focused on expanding the number of childcare spaces in the city. And of course, they're one of several tools that can be used to help address the childcare need in the city. Consistent with the Mitigation Fee Act and the Nexus standards, we completed a Nexus study. It's part of your packet. You just adopted it that establishes the maximum allowable fees for both residential and non-residential development. It's not at all uncommon that the maximum allowable fees are too high. That is, they may start to impact the financial feasibility of new development. So what you see on the right, um, well, on the left are the maximum fees calculated as part of the Nexus study, but what you see on the right are a set of recommended fees. You might be noticing that these fees are approximately half of the maximum and then rounded down. Um, in my view, this approach across the board helps us maintain the, uh, or it's a proportional reduction and it maintains the proportionality across land use categories. But again, this will be up to you. You have the authority to adopt fees if you decide to proceed with an impact fee program at any level up to the maximum. Um, if tonight you decide to move forward with a child care impact fee program, the fees will be considered for adoption as part of the next reading of the ordinance by resolution. The next several slides show you how we um, arrive at the recommended fees. Um, we'll show you what other cities are charging and how the new child care fees affect the overall burden for new development. So in these next slides, we're focusing um, not just, or just on the non-residential land use categories per your prior direction. And starting with office and R&D, relative to other cities that charge childcare impact fees, a, a fee of $10 per square foot of new, of new development would put you way out in front of the pack. Um, a reduced fee of $5 still has you among the leaders, but behind Santa Monica, which has been quite aggressive in its childcare efforts, and Livermore, where the fee is a broader, um, it's a broader social and human services fee of which childcare is just one part. For retail, we have a maximum fee of $5 a square foot versus a reduced fee of $2.50 a square foot. This puts you in a similar position below Santa Monica and Livermore, but closer to San Francisco. For hotel land use categories, we move from $3.35 a square foot to $1.60 a square foot. Um, San Francisco charges um, a little bit more at $2 a square foot, just for comparison. And we're in a very similar situation for industrial. Here we have a reduced fee of $1.60 a square foot. It's lower than San Francisco and Livermore, um, just, just a bit higher than San Mateo. So while the preceding slides showed you just how the nexus-based maximum fees and the reduced fees compare with child care impact fees charged in other jurisdictions, this slide estimates the total fee burden in San Carlos. 
So for each land use category on the left, we calculated the total fee burden per square foot of new development. Um, the existing fees, I believe Sajudi mentioned, include traffic impact, sewer, and commercial linkage fees. This calculation doesn't include planning or um, building permit fees. We then indicate what the total fee burden would be if the child care fees were to be adopted at the maximum levels and the reduced levels, and we show the percent increase as well. The resulting, uh, the resulting increases range from about 8% to 23% uh, for the reduced fees. You had another request from our last study session on this topic, and that was, well, how does San Carlos's existing fee burden compare to the total fee burden in other nearby jurisdictions? And how does all of that shift if the reduced child care fees are incorporated into that analysis? So we looked at impact fees in Belmont, Redwood City, San Mateo, South San Francisco, and Menlo Park. The first set of vertical bars are the office and R&D, and then we move into retail, and then hotel, and then industrial. And the solid orange bar is San Carlos currently. You can see it increases a little bit. The orange bar with the diagonal lines is when we add in the reduced child care fee. So adding in that reduced child care fee do not change your relative ranking for um, office R&D or industrial. For retail, the reduced child care fees bring you um, just a smidge ahead of San Mateo and South San Francisco. For hotel, the reduced child care fees, or adding in the reduced child care fees bring you, again, just a bit ahead of San Mateo, but well below Belmont and Menlo Park. In no case here are we seeing a competitive disadvantage by adopting the reduced fees. We also took a deeper dive into how a few of our neighboring cities are managing their child care programs. So Redwood City, for example, um, they do not charge a child care impact fee, but the city employs a full-time child care coordinator who's housed in the Parks and Recreation Department. Um, the city's waived all planning-related fees associated with large family child care facilities. In South San Francisco, child care also is housed in the Parks Division, and the city manages three preschools there. Uh, a fee in South San Francisco was adopted in 2001. They have a current balance of about $2 million, and they've been spending and um, collecting and spending along the way. Um, they just approved a child care preschool center for 80 children with total costs expect expected around $8 to $10 million. San Mateo, city of San Mateo has, a child, has had a child care fee since 2004, and it applies to new development over 10,000 square feet. Um, it has a current balance of more than a million dollars. And in San, San Mateo, to support parents and providers, the city partners with the San Mateo County 4Cs, the Child Care Coordinating Council. I know you're familiar with their work. So your decision to proceed with a child care impact fee, it may depend in part on how the revenue can be used and how effective you think the fee program will be. Um, the Mitigation Fee Act, as I've mentioned a couple of times now, really constrains how impact fee revenue can be used. In case of um, child care, the fee revenue can be used to expand the number of child care spaces. It can take the form of acquiring land, um, building a center, which um, I understand is probably not your preferred use of funds, subsidizing the development of a child care facility being built by a private developer, for example, and or even potentially offering loans or grants to home daycare providers to help fund improvements um, that would allow those operators to expand their capacity. Importantly, the revenue cannot be used to subsidize operations or otherwise provide direct assistance to families. Um, but in prior study sessions, we received, received direction that you're interested in solutions that are really focused on creating spaces and dire directly helping the San Carlos community as much as possible. So if you move forward with an impact fee program, you'll see in the draft ordinance that there's a build on site option. And what this is intended to do is provide an option for developers who are provide, proposing large enough projects to build a childcare facility on site rather than pay the fee. This is really only a realistic option if the size of the development is such that it can accommodate a minimum of 5,000 square feet of childcare space. Um, we, uh, what we've learned is that if the child care space is any smaller, it's much more challenging to operate with any efficiency, and the si it's the size of the larger project, or rather the size of the larger project should be large enough um, 
I'm sorry, the size of the project should be large enough such that the uh, child care space is really an ancillary space or an amenity space rather than one of the primary uses on site. Um, the ordinance proposes that new development greater than 50,000 square feet may allocate 10% of the space to child care such that the minimum size of the child care space is 5,000 square feet, which would serve at least 50 children or about 50 children. Of course, the space is only of benefit if the developer also contracts with a licensed operator and child care um, and the child care uh, needs, if, if the child care use works within the general plan and zoning requirements as well, of course. Um, another option, if on-site development is not feasible, the city could consider letting the applicant meet its fee obligation by building a new child care center off-site, and that would need to be mutually agreed to. Thank you, Ashley. Um, you know, I know that was a lot of information, but all that data is just really important um, when you guys are considering uh, to adopt an ordinance establishing a child care development impact fee. Again, it will only apply to non-residential developments and um, will include a build on site option. Now, if the council chooses to move forward with adopting the ordinance, today would be considered the first reading, and the second reading would occur on August 8, 2022. And during the second reading, a resolution adopting the exact fee levels, which again would be based on tonight's feedback from council, would also be considered for adoption during that same council meeting. And uh, that would make the ordinance go into effect on September 8, 2022. That concludes our presentation. Me, Ashley, Al, Adam, we're all here to answer any questions. Again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Sajudi, great presentation. Thank you, Ashley. Um, we'll open it up to questions. Council Member Dugan. Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor, and uh, thank you for the, uh, the good report and all the uh, very good work on this. Um, and I appreciate highlighting the work we've already done as a city on child care, um, but uh, this is truly uh, substantive um, when you think about uh, our ability to actually get more child care in town. So I um, uh, really uh, like what we're doing here. Um, some questions though. Uh, first, I just wanna make sure this works like our other fees in that this is just with net new square footage. So if someone tears down 20,000 feet and put it up 100,000 feet, the fees due on the 80,000, right? Yes. Okay, and it's a one-time thing if uh, the, uh, the ownership of that changes, but the square footage doesn't change, the fee doesn't come back around, does it? No, it's, it'll just be a one-time fee, unless there's a special use permit required during the, the change and there's a net new square footage. Okay, but, but O is tied to new square footage. Yes. Okay, great. Um, and then uh, fees are great. Uh, we can do good work uh, with them, uh, but we really do need child care now. Um, so I'm very glad we have a direct build option that we're considering. Uh, and, and I just wanna make sure that, that it works without any un unintended consequences. So um, I'm a little hung up on why we want to limit it to just projects 50,000 feet or over. It sounds like the constraint is we feel like they need to be at least 5,000 square foot facilities. But I think if someone wants to have a 5,000 foot childcare and a 20,000 foot development, I think we should be fine with that. So is there any reason we should limit it to just 50,000 and over, or should we just say it has to be at least 5,000 square feet? That's a great question. I'll have Ashley answer that. It is a good question, thank you. Um, as we think about the kinds of applications that are gonna come before the city, they are, for the most part, not going to be primarily child, new child care development. So the thought is that the child care is really gonna be an ancillary use. And um, in, in your example, I wish I remembered the numbers, if it was like, what, a 20,000 square foot um, new development and 5,000 square feet of child care, that would be 25% of the square footage that they'd be allocating to child care. And while there may be no reason not to accept an offer like that, it's very unlikely that 
um, with the economics of the development, a, a developer or an applicant would want to allocate that much potentially revenue generating space to child care. That may that I mean that might be the case, but uh, you know why would we want to preempt that as an option for them? I mean, don't we just want to say that um, a minimum size of five thousand square feet is what we're requiring, and That's what we're after, yes. and if they want to devote twenty five, thirty, fifty percent of it to child care, we should be okay with that. I, I would you know. What you want is a child care on site that has all the potential to operate as efficiently as possible. Because yeah. in particular, what concerns me is, um, I believe is it's proposed here, if we, if someone was proposing 100% child care, like they just want to build a new child care center, I believe, and, and it was under 50,000 square feet, um, they they would have to pay the fee as well. So they're providing child care and would also have to pay the fee, correct? Right, so any new child care use is exempt from impact fees generally in the city? Is that one of the regulatory? I need to step back and let city staff. Sure. <laughs> I mean, that that's true. It's because we've already exempted child care otherwise. Okay. Um, okay, that helps. Um, and then, um, and then I'm wondering about larger developments. So, um, take say 500,000 square foot development. Now, 10% of that would be a 50,000 square foot uh, childcare center. That that's probably more than anyone would ever want to build. Um, so, is there a provision to provide for that? Like, for example, say they they wanted to build a 10,000 foot. Would they get an exemption for you know the first hundred thousand square feet of that development? Then they could pay the fee on the other four hundred thousand square feet. Or are we saying if they don't do ten percent, they don't get any fee relief? The thought here is that an application of that size would be probably part of a development agreement, not necessarily subject to a development agreement, but part of a development agreement because of the size of the project, at which point you have very broad latitude to negotiate um, for the size of a child care facility that makes sense, a combination of on-site versus and a fee potentially, um, broad latitude to do what really makes sense for the development and the community at that point. I mean, sure, I understand plan development. I guess I just don't know why we wouldn't allow a partial direct build option. I mean, is there any reason we wouldn't want to do that? It, meaning like the 500,000, if they just want to do 10,000, we relieve them of 100,000 worth of fee. That's something that could be negotiated with them. Well, wouldn't we, I mean, is there any reason not to just make that part of, part of this fee if we're not in plan development? Good evening, Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council. Could you say a little bit more, uh, Council Member Duggan, about your um, idea? Yeah, thank you, Al. It's Council Member Duggan. Um, I'm sorry. The, uh, um, so the, uh, it, the idea is just if someone's doing a, a larger development uh, and, and the 10% would be required for the fee relief, right, for the direct bill. But if that 10% is just, you know, doesn't fit into their project, you know, I, I'm just interested in encouraging as much direct build as possible. So I would rather they do a partial direct build and get partial fee relief than decide they're not going to do build any child care and now we have that, you know, four or five year delay between receiving a fee and maybe doing something with it. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I'm just asking maybe we should consider, um, uh, you know, just that, a partial direct build. Mm -hmm. My example was 500,000 square foot project to do direct build, they'd have to do 50,000 square feet of child care wouldn't we want them to be able to do 10,000 square feet of child care and get partial fee relief? Yeah, I think that's an option. And in fact, what I think I understand about the way the ordinance is set up right now is that that would be negotiable. Uh, isn't, isn't that correct? Yeah, so it would be negotiable. You could do it that way. Now, if you want to codify that in the ordinance, uh, that might actually um, limit 
uh, your ability to negotiate to some extent. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, and so that, that's just one idea, but you could theoretically, yes, you could, you could change the ordinance to do it that way. And one comment I wanted to make about, um, developments under 50,000 square feet, a developer still has the option to uh, build childcare in a development less than 50,000 square feet. So this, this ordinance does not limit um, a developer that wants to build a small child care facility in the, in a development less than 50,000 square feet. And I don't, I'm not sure that that was clear. Well, they would still have to pay the full fee though. Isn't that right under this ordinance? Uh, under the ordinance, um, they would have the ability to, I'm, and you can clarify this, I don't think they would have to pay the full fee. They could actually, and is that right? Yeah. So I think what they could do is um, either you could negotiate with them uh, to build a facility at the full fee if you're if that's okay, or they could pay a partial fee and build up a, a smaller or some small facility as well. So through an agreement with the city, could be a development agreement or some other kind of sure. uh, contractual agreement, um, they could do either one of those um, ideas. So it does not limit. Uh, the city or the developer. But the average developer reading the code wouldn't be aware of that option. That, that's what I'm concerned about. I, yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. I no, mean, go it, ahead. I think it does, it does say something in the ordinance, doesn't it? That um, through another type of agreement, uh, a developer could uh, negotiate with the city to build something. And, I, and if it's not clear in the ordinance, it, it should be clear. Yeah, I, I just want to make sure that it's very easy for yeah, people to it. use this direct build option and actually build the child care because that's what we're trying to accomplish here. I'm a lot more interested in making sure it's as easy as possible for developers to understand this option and actually build it as opposed to handing us money and, you know, five, six years later, maybe more child care comes around. And maybe um, it'll take us just a moment to locate that language and, and point uh, pointed out in the ordinance for you uh, to see if you think it's clear enough. So okay. maybe we could do yeah, that through the through the so chair. That the, it's it's in this. Um, it's the second paragraph that kind of falls on this, the next page on page uh, one thousand four of the packet um, that talks about an agreement as a possibility to satisfy the requirement. It's in section eight point five two point oh six zero, which is the same one where the fifty thousand uh, dollar or fifty thousand square foot. Um, numbers stated. Okay. Um, we are happy to, you know, clarify additionally in the ordinance if it's if it's unclear. So we're happy to go back and um, and edit that. Okay. I just if it, it, an agreement would would slow down the process, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's so so here in the ordinance, it said it can be um, articulated in a development agreement or a similar mutually agro uh, um, agreed upon agreement, which could be an MOU or something that works um, quickest for the city and the developer, as long as both parties mutually agree to the terms. Got it. And MOU is required anyway, right? Because that even if any direct bill needs the MOU. So, okay. All right. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thanks, John. I appreciate those clarifications. Council Member Collins. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you, Sajudi and Ashley. Um, very thorough presentation, very informative, too. I'm very, I just think you just did a great job on it. Um, a couple questions, though, I don't know if who answers them, Ashley or Sajudi. Um, a couple things stuck out to me um, on the office and R&D, I think, was it? Yeah, um, Santa Monica and Livermore have pretty high fees. Uh, how are those working out for them? Do we know? Uh, are they are they prohibitive? Uh, have they discouraged uh, office and R and D growth? Have they been a non factor, or is it too hard to tell because their overall fees just incorporate those? I haven't looked at it very specifically in a while now. Um, Santa Monica does not seem to have very much trouble. They have high impact fees in general. They do not seem to be seeing any slowdown in their development activity. Um, in Livermore, the fee is, um, childcare is a part of a health and human services fee, and so there's more that they're doing with it. They're also um, 
Um, it's also a program that's helping with some of their senior programs and senior facilities, for example. And so um, it does not seem to be deterring development, but there's more that they're doing with the fee as well. And I understand they're completely different demographics. And there's a it's fairly complex that you just can't break it down to one fee. Um, so the, the, this whole concept of providing childcare space at 10%, um, is that um, a commonplace practice? Is it somewhat commonplace uh, in the development world these days in, in municipalities? Um, speaking not just of child care impact fees, but impact fee programs in general, there are often provisions that developers may comply with the impact fee requirement by providing in-kind or actually building the facil facilities. Um, in those uh, circumstances, you often need to enter into credit and reimbursement agreements and those, and those types of things, but it is not at all uncommon that a developer might comply with the impact fee requirement through a direct build. I guess that's that's more to the point of my question is, are they actually building the child care space? Um, in other words, is there are there 100,000 square foot facilities out there that are building 10,000 square feet of child care space? And, and are they, is that, is that uh, at, at, in, in any way a potential deterrent for, uh, for co uh, commercial developers to do that or is there a certain a percentage of them that say, we're just not going to do that, we don't have enough, you know, we have too many things that we need to put into that 100,000 square feet, so we'll, we'll pay the fee. Right. Well, so it is an alternative. It's not a require, this, this on-build or build-on-site option is, it's an alternative to paying the fee. And the developer would have to determine whether or not that makes sense for that for that particular project? Is there physical space? Is there, you know, what are the other needs of the other uses? Is, is child on-site child care a use that would be a benefit to the employers, an attractive thing for an employer to be able to offer to its employees? Um, I am not, this is a, this is a creative approach within the realm of child care fees. It's a creative approach to trying to accelerate the provision of child care spaces rather than having the development of child care spaces lag a little bit, right? When the fee comes in, the fee then needs to be deployed and leveraged. But this is an attempt to um, respond to council direction to get child care spaces built as quickly as possible. But it's, um, I do not know of very many child care um, impact fee programs where this is codified in the ordinance. It happens more often in through the develop through development agreements. I, I mean, I'm, I'm fully supportive of providing more ch child care in town and encouraging developers to do it. I, what I don't want to happen is that we put ourselves in a position where we've made it unattractive for developers to come here. And that leads to my last question is, you know, what this is probably more of speculative on your part is that What's the over? What is your impression of the overall um, attractiveness of from of our city to potential commercial developers, or is it becoming a non-factor because so many municipalities are doing it and and they're saying, well, you know, this is nothing new. We have to do it in this city and that city. So San Carlos is pretty much uh, following suit. My understanding is that there are a lot of developers interested in building and being in San Carlos. We looked at this question in a number of different ways as we presented in the in the PowerPoint, um, both a comparison, you know, what how would these child care fees compare to other jurisdictions with child care fees? What does it do to the aggregate fee burden in San Carlos? And then how might that aggregate fee burden in San Carlos compare with the aggregate fee burden in other nearby jurisdictions? I did not see any um, red flags or I didn't see anything very alarming from a competitive perspective there. It didn't change your ranking to other nearby cities uh, very significantly. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. It is speculative, though, so <laughs> thank you. I know. I know. I, know. <laughs> I didn't want to mean to put you on the spot. I just wanted to get your, your, uh, your overall impression of it because, you know, obviously this is what you do, so yeah. thanks again. Good questions. Good questions, Ron. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor Beck. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And I, uh, I also want to thank John and Ron for the questions. It was helpful. Um, so I'm, uh, can you, uh, first question I had is when you talk about, and this may be 
Um, I don't know who should answer this. When you talk about the fee burden, are there does that are there things that aren't included in this number that are sort of any kind of planning fees, building fees, other stuff? Like how does that overall compare to a San Mateo or something else? I mean, because I guess my question, I see these fees, but maybe the our planning, some of our planning fees are lower, so the overall number isn't quite as bad. Um, we tried to keep our comparison as apples to apples as possible, focused just on these impact fees. So while we have not reflected planning or building fees in San Carlos, we also excluded them in the other cities that we looked at. To the extent that, to your question, to the extent that the other cities are significantly higher or lower than San Carlos with respect to planning or building fees, that's not reflected in this aggregate comparison. Right, so, so we don't have a, but when you say you don't compare apples to apples, how, how would that not, by including those, how would that not give us a better picture? Typically, um, so with the impact fees and when I'm comparing them across, uh, across jurisdictions, I wanna normalize them to a per square foot of development. That's one way I can keep the comparison okay. apples to apples. When we start to talk about planning and building fees, that's not necessarily how those fees are calculated. They may be based on the type of application. They may be based on the value of the construction. And I haven't put together prototypes, you know, um, like a, a sample development project to help work through that. So we kept everything on a per square foot basis, uh, just looking at impact fees. Okay, and and how do we define the various categories of the and I, I, hotel? I understand and, and, and stuff, but I'm just struggling between sort of when we look at industrial and office and R and D. Do we bifurcate it all? So if something is an industrial facility, but they've got you know some office space because that's just how they operate right there. So they might have that. Do we look at that when we calculate the fees, or is it? You're zoned for X, so this is what it is, and that's what the fee is. How does that work? One of the um, underpinning assumptions that help us to differentiate fees across land use categories is employment density. That's one of the ways that we um, get at the proportionality of different land uses. And um, it used to be, when I started doing this work a long time ago, that R&D was more like industrial. It looked, it felt, um, employment densities were a little more like industrial, and industrial and R&D went together. Over the last 10, 15 years, we've really seen R&D start to look a little bit more like office, with employment densities more like office. So there's an example um, where employment density is really driving the way that we're um, categorizing our land use categories, if ever, um, or categorizing the land uses. If ever you had a situation where an applicant came to the counter and um, wasn't sure or wanted to contest which land use category most accurately fit their use. Um, we have a provision in here typically that it's left to the community development director or similar. Okay. Um, and then I, I, I was intrigued with some of the things that uh, Councilmember Dugan mentioned about because I do think we need to encourage more on site as best as we can, right? That's that's the best way to get more childcare versus trying to build a, I mean, I, I know how expensive it is for us on the impact fees for housing, how difficult and how expensive it is. So the more we can do that. Um, so I'm, I'm glad that we got the clarification on the sort of negotiation and agreement because I think that's helpful to, to understand from that. Um, and then I just would, and not really a question, but kind of echo a little bit of, I know we're sort of, you know, not don't have all the, you know, have a crystal ball on this, but um, just read a little bit of concern, like uh, Council Member Collins mentioned. I just don't want to, uh, you know, price ourselves out of the market because I do think that uh, the, the in, that we lose the intention of these fees, that we end up not not getting development to come in um, eventually because you know, people don't want to come in. They can go to Redwood City or somewhere else, and, and it, it's a more cost-effective place, and we don't... Uh, assuming that we're not gonna get funding from the state or the county for other things, that's sort of our vehicle to get to solve some of these problems. And so um, I understand it's sort of tough to, to balance this. So I guess it's more just registering opinion versus a, a question around that. So, but thank you. Okay, thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, I don't have any questions. I enjoyed serving with Council Member Palmer Lohan on the Child Care Subcommittee, and we've um, gone through this quite a bit, so. Um, I have no questions. Uh, I guess we'll go ahead and open it up to public comment. Okay. 
If you're participating by Zoom, now is the time to raise your hand. Uh, and I don't know if we have any speaker cards here for in-person. No, I have no speaker cards. Uh, I do see a hand raised on Zoom from Sarah Kinahan. Uh, you should be able to unmute. Uh, good evening, Mayor McDowell, council members, and city staff. My name is Sarah Kinahan. I am a San Carlos resident, a mom of two sons who use childcare in the city, and coordinator for the San Mateo County Child Care Partnership Council. I'm here tonight to express appreciation and support to the city for considering a child care development impact fee. Uh, I wish I was here with our updated needs assessment data, a full report. We don't yet have that. It will be available in the fall. But I do have some preliminary data for the city that shows a current need of at least 500 new child care spaces for children zero to five. Uh, this is a combination of demand from residents and people coming into the city to work. Um, there was a question earlier about whether transitional kindergarten will impact this need for child care. And we have done projections through 2032. And while we show a decrease in the need um, as children move into transitional ki kindergarten, we, we are projecting uh, at least uh, a need of 400 new child care spaces at that time. And I want to note that the demand from people coming into the city to work actually is projected to increase by 2032. So you would be addressing that need through this type of development fee on non-residential uh, developments. Um, the other question was whether other cities have seen developers choose the on-site option. And I know of at least five commercial developments in surrounding cities that are including six to 10,000 square foot childcare facilities. So again, thank you for being a leader on this issue and working with our organization over the last few years on ways the city can support child care in San Carlos. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And thanks for all the good work you do in the county. Crystal, is anyone else uh, in Zoom? Uh, no hands from the public. Okay, I'll open it up to discussion now. I see Council Member Palmer Lohan's hand. Great. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and and uh, thank you also, Sarah, for the opportunity uh, to work with you on this and subcommittee. And I also want to thank staff uh, for taking a very <clears throat> business-minded uh, focus uh, to um, how to approach uh, this topic in our community. You know, San Carlos is a really remarkable city when we think about all that it has to offer. Um, it really is very much self-contained. Um, we are enjoying uh, an economic growth uh, that we haven't seen in quite some time with over 4 million square feet of commercial office um, being built. Uh, we are, um, you know, we've completed our east side uh, visioning plan uh, that articulates the importance of uh, the creation of affordable housing, uh, the importance of uh, child care, uh, not to mention some, um, you know, tending to the environmental impacts of these projects and um, addressing um, our, um, our climate change uh, concerns, among, among others. Um, you know, we have uh, fabulous schools. Um, we are able to attract the whole, the whole demographics, I think, of the community have really changed over the last, um, you know, uh, do dozen years or so. Um, um, the, um, you know, but what's, uh, what's left <laughs> out, uh, in all of that, unfortunately is our, is our kids and the kids, um, are, you know, at this age, um, are the ones, uh, that don't, um, have the ability to speak up for themselves. And as we've talked many times in council, uh, their families are busy raising them, uh, their hands are full and uh, the ability to come uh, to these chambers and, and talk about, uh, this particular issue is challenging. And, you know, just to give you, you know, some color on this, I um, have a good friend who several years ago had her first child and planned to take uh, the minimum amount of time off of her work. Um, she's a tech worker and, um, you know, makes a very good living. And um, she planned to just do the minimum amount of time um, and then get back straight to work. And the difficulty for her in finding childcare was so great, it prolonged her ability to get back into the workforce. And um, I believe that taking this step, um, and one that is prudent, I believe the analysis that's been provided tonight shows that the cost structure um, will fall within a framework that won't inhibit um, that development that's already well underway 
and has been talked about in many um, forums with respect to that development. Um, and it will build that important uh, step um, and bridge uh, for um, women mostly because oftentimes childcare um, falls uh, to the responsibility of the woman to participate fully in the economy, uh, which um, is very important. Um, and so I'm um, appreciating the fact that this could be one small step uh, to eliminate that cost prohibitive burden of $100,000 per child. So that's really the biggest barrier that's getting in our way of making sure we have adequate capacity in our community. Um, this could really help to pay that down. Um, and I do appreciate Council Member Dugan's concern about making sure that we allow ourselves flexibility in this ordinance. And I do appreciate Vice Mayor Rack's concern, as well as Council Members Collins, that we don't price ourselves out of out of the market. Um, all signs I'm seeing <laughs> are uh, very well, very favorable uh, for this uh, action at this time. And I believe the wind is at our back. Um, it's innovative, um, it's contemporary with what some of the other communities are doing, and I'm really hopeful uh, that council decides to take this very important step tonight, and um, I look forward to hearing uh, from the rest of you um, as we move into comments. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Um, I'm going to ask for a motion to close the public hearing before we continue with council discussion. Is there a motion? To close the public hearing. Second. Crystal, could you please call the roll? Councilmember Palmer Lohan? Yes. Vice Mayor Rack? Yes. Councilmember Dugan? Yes. Councilmember Collins? Yes. And Mayor McDowell? Yes. Thank, Thank you. you, Crystal. Okay, we'll move on to Councilmember Dugan. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and uh, thank you, uh, Laura, for um, just such a um, good explanation of how vital uh, child care is um, in San Carlos and in our society in general. Um, I, I, I wouldn't, you know, just uh, that, that very helpful context here. And child care has been, um, you know, sorely needed in town for years and years, uh, more of it, and it's been a top goal of us as a city for years and years. So, um, uh, and, and, and we've done some uh, work in this area. We've, we've looked at, we've streamlined fees, we've streamlined, um, tried to make it as easy as possible for child care to come to town. Uh, but none of that really um, is gonna directly get child care built. Um, so I'm, I'm very enthusiastic about uh, what we're uh, gonna do this evening. Uh, this is a very substantive, um, Ordinance. It's, um, uh, it represents a lot of work by by staff, by our subcommittee, uh, by by our consultants. It's a very uh, very solid program. So I'm I'm very excited about it, uh, especially in the context of all the uh, development that is coming to our town, and how much additional strain there'll be on our child care system. Uh, the the timing of this is uh, very appropriate, um, and I'm very glad. Um, uh, I, I believe we'll be moving forward with this. Um, now, there's a very real potential. We'll, we'll, we're going to develop a, a lot of fees uh, from this, and um, I, I just want us to really uh, be cognizant that it's not great for us to, to, to take down a lot of fees here if we don't put that to work quickly. So if in uh, three, four, five years we've got $20 million in the bank, uh, we, we, we've done something wrong. So I really want us to, um, uh, number one, think of how can we engage and encourage the direct build option, because that's how we're gonna get child care actually built in the near term. So anything we can do as we're talking to developers, et cetera, to be encouraging that, uh, I think we should do that. Um, and then secondly, how can we be really creative with the fees uh, that we do take down? Um, I really like the opportunities of uh, providing loans and grants to um, child care operators in town. I think that could be a very direct, immediate way to get uh, fees um, uh, translated into child care in town as soon as possible. And I just hope um, you know we stay very open-minded and, and keep looking around the country on what's the best way to get these fees translated into uh, child care as soon as possible. Um, and then to that end, um, I am very glad we're, we're also doing the direct build option. And I would just 
to my colleagues propose one amendment to that uh, because again I just want everyone to um, be aware of the direct build option and just have every incentive to do it and I'm just worried that um, saying it's only available to large developments over 50,000 square feet I just think that might preclude some smaller developer from even thinking about it. Um, so I think we accomplished the same goal just by saying uh, it has to be at least 5,000 square feet. So instead of saying it has to be a project greater than 50,000 square feet, it can be any size project smaller than that um, as long as they build at least 5,000 square feet of, uh, of, of child care. I don't think that makes any change to this program, I just think it makes it very clear that even smaller developments could build meaningful child care as well. Um, that's all I have. Thank you. Thanks, John. Vice Mayor Beck. Okay. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I just um, want to say first thanks to staff and for everyone for the Great work on this. I, I, I feel like this is just sort of another another piece in the holistic effort of, of addressing the the gap that we face in childcare slots. And I'm I'm excited to be supporting this and look forward to you know continue to look at this issue uh, in a holistic manner. I think that's the best way long term for us to to um, really meet meet the need and and to um, address the the gap that's there. So I look forward to supporting this and. Um, Look forward to see how things work out. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, I guess I'll go ahead and share my comments. I too want to thank staff. This was a tremendous amount of work over the last several years, um, and I'm so pleased that we're, this has been brought forward tonight. Um, I'm supportive of this fee. I think it's very reasonable. Um, I too want to emphasize it's my top priority to have the child care built on site. Um, so I thank my colleagues for raising that today as well. Um, I think that, you know, as we talk about development, and I think Council Member Palmer Lohan talked about this too, is when we talk a lot about the impact of development. We talk about traffic and um, people going downtown, and um, another impact is certainly child care because a lot of these um, workers will need child care. And I, I certainly was a user of it when I was a full-time working mom. I had childcare in the basement of my building, and it was so convenient to drop my infant off and go to work, and I could visit him at lunchtime. And so I think that this is truly um, a great benefit for employers, and I think that is being realized. Um, and also, it can be a great benefit to our community. Um, I also, I, I support Council Member Dugan's amendment, um, and I also agree that we should make sure that any fees that are collected should be put to use rather quickly. Um, I've spoken to a lot of child care providers here in San Carlos, and um, certainly land acquisition and acquisition of property is just really cost prohibitive, so I think that we will have op ample opportunity to put the fees to work through um, loans or grants, so I agree with that too. So I want to thank everyone for their work, and I will pass it over to Council Member Collins. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, again, thanks to staff for uh, great work. Um, I, I think it's a, um, a great step in the right direction. I, I do want to make sure that we have a check-in, uh, whether it's six months or a year, a periodic check-in to find out how this is impacting um, developers. With, with respect to an amendment, though, I, I really prefer an incentive-based approach. I, I'm, I'm not... I'm not a fan of, of uh, you know, lowering the threshold so that, you know, we're, we're imposing a greater burden on smaller developments. I'm not sure that's the right way to go, so I would not support that particular amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Vice Mayor Buck. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, <clears throat> Ed, one, I wanted to comment on the amendment, but also a question. There's been discussion about loans and other things. Can you just clarify... Um, can the fees be used for, I thought they can't be used for operational purposes, right? They can be used for infrastructure uh, only. Is that accurate? Correct. So the idea behind a loan to a um, at-home daycare provider would be um, if they can currently serve eight children, but if they were to install a new 
little toilet, they could serve 12. Or if they create some more outdoor yard space, they could serve additional children. If there's some capital sort of construction improvement that they can make to their home, to their facility, that allows them to um, serve more children, that's the idea behind that program. I understand. Thank, that, thank you for that clarification. And um, I, I guess I would say I, I don't, I, I would say that I don't support the amendment as, as sort of proposed because uh, I don't think it might make sense to have to put a minimum of 5,000 square feet around it. If you're talking about a 10,000 square foot build, it may make sense for them to have a 1,000 foot or 1,500 square foot uh, childcare facility, but 5,000 is too prohibitive. So by having that minimum, I think you defeat the purpose. I prefer the sort of the agreement approach that has a sliding scale. To me, that would be a better better approach to do it. I think having a minimum um, is just sort of, we're not going to get anywhere, I, I think, by having a minimum versus a sliding scale. Council, Council Member Collins. Um, yeah, I just thought of something. Uh, I'll make it quick. I, I'm wondering if maybe we could uh, come up with a modification later, kind of work on that a little bit more, uh, see what makes sense. I, I'm, I'm, I'm with Adam on that, that I'm not sure it makes sense to set an absolute number. I think we, I think that, that just requires a little bit more research, and we need to talk about that a little bit more. But I don't want to throw the baby out with bathwater. I want to get, I would like to uh, support this and have it passed, and then take that up at a later point as a, as a, you know, potential uh, modification. So, Judy, you, you'd mentioned that you would look into this a little bit more. Is that correct? Yes, we can we can look into it. Um, I guess if if we go with um, Councilman uh, Collins' suggestion of coming back and modifying the the ordinance, we can do it that way. However, if we if we were, I guess, as a question for Greg, if we were to modify it before the second reading, is is that allowed? Yeah, we, we, after the first reading, uh, we are, are not able to change the, the text of the ordinance without reintroducing it. Um, so if, if we wanted to make a change tonight and, and let us know the, the change that you were, through your motion to, to introduce, um, we could bring back something that you had modified from the text here and then we could adopt as you modify it tonight. Um, and, you know, I, I think, just this is a suggestion. I, I hate to venture into <laughs> into the area where I'm just I'm the attorney. I'm not the policymaker. But it seems to me you might be able to accomplish the goal by removing the ratio of 10% of total square footage, um, because as Councilmember Dugan was talking about, that's that could be a a really big space on a larger development. So it's on the other side of it um, that I think that that percentage might cause some confusion. Um, so if we remove that, then you're just applying the standard to a 50,000 square foot or larger project, and then it still would have the mutually agreed um, provision in it. So it would be able to accommodate um, a, uh, something smaller than 5,000 if that was it, or something larger than the, than, than the minimum would require. But that's just a suggestion um, if, if that's the direction the council wants to go. I guess um, just just to repeat our conversation earlier, the risk of um, removing any kind of threshold when you get um, child care centers that are less than 5,000 square feet, let's say 3,000 or 2,000, um, the it's it's not feasible operationally. Is that correct, Ashley? So the fee the operational feasibility and the economic feasibility starts going down. So then child care operators are less likely to operate in these spaces, and it 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 really wouldn't make sense economically. Economically. Do you want to add anything to that? Right. I think we even heard from um, Sarah Can I, yeah. this yeah. evening saying, you know, there are five other projects in the area, all size between six and 10,000 square feet. One of the things I've learned over the years is that if you get below a certain number of children, you lose some of the operating efficiencies. So there we're talking not about development feasibility, but operational feasibility. Um, the number of staff you're hiring and all of that, you start to, you see some feasibility at, at scale. And for a child care center, that ha tends to be around 5,000 square feet. Not, I can't say that you couldn't have an, uh, an, a very efficient center at 4,500 square feet. I 
you know, there's no, it's not binary, but it's around 5,000 square feet that you start to serve enough children to see a really efficient operation. Okay, I see some more hands raised. Uh, Council Member Dugan. Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I, I just wanted to, to clarify, and I, and, and I understand, number one, I mean, this is a bit of a minor detail. I mean, you know, I, we're all, I, I'm happy we're all in strong agreement on, you know, 98% of what we're doing here. I just wanted to point out that we are setting a hard limit, and, and, and the limit we're setting, no matter what we do here, is who can qualify for the direct build option. And as proposed, we're setting a hard limit that only people building at least 50,000 square feet of net new footage can qualify for direct build. So anyone building smaller than that um, is not eligible for direct build. So um, I simply made the observation that they, you know, the 50,000 feet is derived because that's 10 times the 5,000 square feet. Um, so I'm just saying, why don't we define it as the 5,000 square feet so that we don't preclude a 40,000 foot development that also wants to do 5,000 square feet? That's all. I just thought that was a helpful amendment, but you know, it's, uh, I don't want it to interrupt the, uh, the good work we're otherwise going to do this evening. Thank you, John. Vice Mayor Beck? I guess I'll talk here. Um, I guess, so part of, John, I, I, so thank you. And I had one, I guess one question would be how it would apply in this if, to Council Member Dugan's question, so if you're only adding 40,000, but the overall footprint is more than 50,000, how does that get affected? So the facility itself, you're not, so if the existing facility was 30,000 and now it's an 80,000 foot facility, or I say 70, let's say, so now you're only adding 40,000, but the overall facility might be big enough to qualify for a 5,000 square foot childcare facility. How would something like that play into that? Because we take into account the overall footprint versus the new footprint. Sorry to complicate things. Um, <laughs> I think that's where, I think the, the language that we've proposed um, from staff is to have some flexibility in the agreement because we can't foresee every circumstance that, that might come up with a developer wanting to do this alternative. But um, yeah, it's all, those are all good points. It's kind of hard to do the math if you, if you if you, um, if you say if you lock in 10% and we don't have the agreement, it might it you could end up with kind of absurd result on the other end. Is the point I was trying to make? If you have a much larger than 50,000 square foot, you might have an infeasible childcare requirement, and you're just not going to get anything built on that end. Um, and if you have somebody who wants to build a smaller, uh, who has a 40,000 or, or a smaller, but wants to build it, we want to create that flexibility. So that's why I, I was making that suggestion, but I'm, I'm not, um, I'm, I'm open to any kind of alternative that would allow us some flexibility because I think the intent of this is to really create an, a genuine real alternative for somebody to build a day, a childcare center not just create something that seems like it's gonna, it could happen. We wanna have something that they're gonna do it. And I think creating the thresholds might be uh, um, uh, in, in the way that that, that uh, paragraph is worded might be um, binding us a little bit too tight to these percentages and the square footage is, um, I, so just food for thought for the council. So just to follow on that, could could we clarify, I guess, to and hopefully if John is acceptable, something like this, just clarify in that section that the ability to negotiate an agreement to make sure that we feel like that's we're, we're sort of strengthening that particular statement um, might be at least a step forward and then we can revisit at some point if we think six months down the road it makes more sense to per Ron's point. Uh, well, a suggestion along those lines might be um, uh, Something like, um, and would uh, I'm looking at the last sentence of that first paragraph of 8.52.060, um, mutually agreed upon by the by the developer and the city, to um, with the intention of uh, 
creating a feasible child care, um, a reasonable um, and feasible child care space on site, you know, kind of parroting that to make it reasonable and feasible. Okay, or even, I, I was just thinking, Greg, and not to, uh, to, maybe can we say in there that the city encourages the development of on-site uh, child care facilities and therefore, you know, would, and maybe it's not sort of ordinance language, but something to sort of infer that we would, uh, that that's sort of our pre preferred route in there and then leave it at that and say that our preferred route is to do to take this and, and we would and and you know and negotiating an agreement around this would be uh, a preferred route something so we we sort of indicate a preference to facilities versus the fee would be my and then to john's point we've got 98 percent agreement i don't want to keep dwelling on this yeah, I'm just trying to make give you the ability tonight to, to introduce the ordinance with with the language, and then maybe Sajudi has a suggestion. I, I was thinking, um, can we add it under section one um, after the recitals, because that's where all of the priorities are going, and um, where all of the intention behind the ordinance um, is going as well. So we can add it there, perhaps if if Greg. I just think this is where I'm, we're really on a nuts and bolts thing here, um, and I, I do want to create flexibility. So I, I think we would, I like the idea of having um, a, an additional sentence that cr creates a, um, you know, the, a more flexibility in the agreement that say, says something like, notwithstanding the above, the, the city and the developer can deviate from these requirements to create a feasible uh, building uh, build out of child care um, and then that would create some additional flexibility I think the council might be looking for I'd be fine with oh, sorry I'd be fine with that okay I see uh, council member Palmer Lohan and council member Collins Laurie go ahead Great, thank you. Um, so I think I, I like the idea of adding um, some sort of statement in the early um, portion of the ordinance that articulates what our preference is, because um, we have articulated that multiple times, right, that we would prefer that it get built. Um, and it strikes me that this, um, we're getting tripped up on this 50,000 square foot, um, you know, minimum 5,000 square foot facility. And, and that to me is more or less just an, an example of the kind of the entry point at which one would actually um, be able under these current economic um, circumstances that we're in today, build something out that's feasible. At the same time, economic conditions change over time, right? So I think we wanna be careful about being so prescriptive in our ordinance that it um, expires, right? In terms of its relevancy. Uh, by the time we get one of these deals negotiated. So is it possible that this 50,000 square foot, 5,000 minimum could be expressed as an, an example of what we would like to see under you know the current economic conditions? And, and I also agree with the idea of adding some statement that um, we will reserve the right to negotiate with developers to you know put a, a plan in place that's feasible <laughs> and pencils out, right? So th those are my two cents thinking, listening to the conversation. Uh, th yeah, through the mayor, I, I think that is a, is a good suggestion, Council Member Parmer Lohan. Um, we could phrase that as an, an, as an example, um, and that, might, that would also increase the flexibility in, in dealing with this issue. Okay, hey, Council Member uh, Collins. Sausage making at its best. <laughs> uh, uh, I, Sarah and Laura have been, a, a, you, you've been the principal participants in the subcommittee on this, correct? You, you guys have spent a lot of time with staff. This seems to me well thought through, well thought out uh, ordinance. Uh, I'm, I, I, I'm, I always get nervous when we s try to remake this stuff, um, you know, when it comes to us in nearly final form. But given that, I like, I like, Laura's comment, and I'm wondering, is it possible to have us consider, I don't know, two alternatives, so, you know, basically the same ordinance, but one more flexible, one less flexible in, when we decide uh, when it comes back to us? Is it, Greg, is that, is that possible? 
you know, with a, a tweak, you know, one as is, one with the tweak, so that we can say, okay, we're going to go this way it, or that way? It, it, yeah, um, yeah, Council Member Collins, I, I think uh, I understand where you're coming from, but we, we're not there. If what you're saying is um, have two, two options in the ordinance, I think that's um, difficult to craft, but I think what we're trying to do is accomplish that same sentiment by creating this uh, flexibility in dealing with circumstances of, of someone who proposes the alternative. Okay. Uh, and I think, I think we kind of meet that purpose. If we create two alternatives, then I think we're just gonna have two different sets of criteria that does we might, we might not get the flexibility that we're that we're trying to that you're trying to achieve tonight well no if what you're saying is that what we're what's being proposed already contains that flexibility then i'm all for it yeah okay. and i i think some with some additional language will make it clear that it's the council's intent is to have flexibility in in determining uh the the uh, proposed alternative Okay, so on the table right now is the Palmer Lohan Amendment, correct? Okay, John, did you have a comment? I did, thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I just wanna make sure I understand that and, and thank you, Laura, I think that is a, a good idea uh, because we're all just, we wanna see more direct build. Um, and, and I'm specifically reacting to this hard 500, or yeah, 50,000 um, square foot. Uh, limit um, and um, Adam you raised a great point if someone's just adding to a facility uh, it could be plenty big to accommodate but they're only adding 30,000 feet so they couldn't qualify so um, I you know so I believe Laura's uh, input is let's get rid of all the limits no limit on that and then it's just suggestive that um, as because and that's fine because as all of any proposed direct build will be subject to the memorandum of understanding. And so we're just now providing an example. You know, if the city's gonna agree with it, we want it to be viable health care, which to us means 5,000 square feet or more, um, which, you know, will make sense on any significant project. Um, so I, I think that's the amendment that there, there is no uh, 50,000 foot limit. So I, I completely support that. And then I also support providing guidance that we consider 5,000 square foot and larger child care facilities the ones that we would exempt under a memorandum of, of understanding from the fee. Vice Mayor Beck. So I, um, I would just, uh, so from my perspective, I, I would support what I'm going to call, as it's been called now, the Palmer Lohan Amendment uh, yeah. to this. Uh, and then I, if everyone's good with it, I, or Laura, if you would like to, I, I I would love to sort of move this, but I'm happy if you would prefer to, since it is your amendment. Oh, uh, well, I'm um, yeah. I'm. Go you said you would love to do it, Madam. I don't. I, I don't want to take well, that away I know from you. you. And the, and have done all the work on this issue over with yeah. the subcommittee, so I would yeah. certainly defer to you on that. Go ahead, Laura. It's your amendment. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let me pull up the document. Hang on one second. All right. Um, hang on a second. I'm trying to find the um, meeting action list. And we are on. 10A. Thank you. Um, I move to introduce ordinance number 15, 1585. An ordinance of the City Council of the City of San Carlos adding Chapter 8.52 to the San Carlos Municipal Code establishing a child care development impact fee for non-residential developments in the city of San Carlos that articulates our interest in wanting to have childcare built out and that the exempt and that the um, uh, dimensions provided for minimum size daycare being built on site is used as an example to inform a memorandum of understanding. Second. Okay, before we um, call the roll, Crystal, did I take public hearing on this item? Yes. We did, okay. <laughs> so, okay. Now we go, okay, great. Um, any further discussion on this item? Can I just, uh, can I get one point of clarification? And I think maybe, uh, I don't know, Laura, if you said the word new non-residential, I missed that. I just wanna make sure we're. New non-residential. Thank you, I just make sure we're clear. But thank you. Sorry to put you on the spot. 
It's got to be right. Yeah. Okay. Crystal, could you please call the roll? Okay, hey, Councilmember Collins? Yes. Councilmember Palmer Lohan? Yes. Vice Mayor Rack? Yes. Councilmember Dugan? Yes. And Mayor McDowell? Yes. Okay. What is the will of the council? Should we continue for our last two items? You guys need a break? Short break. Short break. Five, okay. five minutes, get some five minute order. Break. We're going to take a five minute break. Thank you. And we have Rebecca Mendenhall tonight. Good evening, Rebecca Mendenhall, Administrative Services Director. Oh, it's been a while since I've done this. It's just the arrow button, right, Crystal? No, there it goes. It was on. Okay. So before you tonight is the adoption of the development impact fees and the schedule. Uh, local governments often charge these fees as a condition of approval for development projects to fund public improvements to compensate for the demands that these developments have on public infrastructure. These fees are commonly known as development impact fees and they're separate from the cost of services or the user fees which is the next item on your agenda. These rates are reviewed annually and are increased based on the indices identified in the municipal code. Uh, both of these, uh, all three of these impact fees are updated based on the construction cost index and that's based on labor rates and material costs. And you can see that these costs have increased a lot this year due to the supply chain issues and increasing fuel costs associated with obtaining and delivering the materials. So there are three impact fees that would be increased in accordance with the requirements of the municipal code. The first is the park facility development fee, which would increase by 15.15%. These fees are assessed per the Muni Code Section 3.34. This fee is accounted for in the Park and Lou Fund, Fund 27, and is also used for the acquisition, development, renovation, and replacement of parks and recreational areas and, and their development, including equipment for recreational purposes. The second is the zero capacity charge, which will increase by 8%. The zero capacity charge was established under Muni Code Chapter 13.04 to recover costs for the city sewer system infrastructure and assets that provide benefit to the new or expanded connections. And last is the traffic impact fee, which would increase by 15.15%. This fee was established under Muni Code Chapter 8.5 to fund transportation improvements to help accommodate new residents and businesses brought to San Carlos as a result of new development projects. This fee is accounted for in the General Capital Fund or Fund 25 as a restricted account. Since these are development fees, they would be subject to a 60-day noticing period and would be effective August 29th. And the approximate net revenue increases to the fees or to the funds noted here are approximately $216,000. So that concludes my uh, presentation on this item. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Rebecca. Any questions? Council Member Dugan. I just had a quick one, Rebecca. Uh, thank you for the overview. Um, the uh, the fee increases, you know, pretty dramatic, 15% tied to the cost index. Um, that, that I just want to verify that can work in both directions. If you know we enter a recession and all these uh, the supply chain issues work out, and now there's a reduction from that big spike up, would that then be reflected in the next in our next fee review? Yeah, it's, it's a uh, fee that we get from the engineering uh, records, engineering news record, oh, and, okay. and so they c compile the fee, and so if the fees would go down or the cost would go down, I would imagine the fee would not be as high next year. Okay, so it can move in both directions. Okay, thank you. That's all I have. Okay, I don't see any other questions, so uh, we can go ahead to public comment. Now is the time to raise your hand via Zoom if you have a public comment on this item. Crystal, is anyone in the waiting room? Uh, there are no hands from Zoom. 
Madam Mayor, move to close the public hearing. Is there a second? Second. Crystal, could you please call the roll? <clears throat> Councilmember Dugan? Yes. Councilmember Collins? Yes. Councilmember Parma Lohan? Yes. Vice Mayor Rack? Yes. And Mayor McDowell? Yes. Any further discussion from my colleagues? Seeing none, uh, I'll entertain a motion. Madam Mayor, I move to adopt resolution 2022-78. A resolution of the City Council of the City of San Carlos authorizing adjustments to the park facility development fee, sewer capacity charge, and traffic impact fee for fiscal year 2022-2023. Second. Any further discussion? Crystal, could you please call the roll? Vice Mayor Rack? Yes. Councilmember Dugan? Yes. Councilmember Collins? Yes. Councilmember Parma Lohan? Yes. And Mayor McDowell? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We will now move on to 10C, consideration of adopting a resolution authorizing adjustments to the cost of services schedule, user fees, and the approval of an additional budget appropriation in the amount of $10,000 from the general fund unassigned balance to establish a field use fee scholarship program for fiscal year 2022 to 23 and to adopt guidelines for future fee increases. Go ahead, Rebecca. Okay, thank you. So on May 23rd, the council held a study session to discuss the outcomes of a comprehensive overhead allocation and fee and rate study performed by NBS. The purpose of this fee study was to ensure that the city is accounting for the true cost of providing various programs and services. It's the city's goal to have a well-documented and defensible plan that complies with Proposition 218. The distinction between a tax and a fee lies primarily in the fact that a tax is levied as part of the common burden or that benefits the public broadly. And a fee is a charge for a service that has a direct benefit to that individual or business. The city cannot charge more than the cost of providing services, so these results serve as a baseline for establishing the costs or the fees. So the city is currently recovering approximately 66% of the costs associated with providing user and regulatory fee related services. Based on feedback from the council, the city reevaluated some of the fees and reduced the recommended cost recovery from 89% to 85%. For those fees that are not set at 100% cost recovery, the general fund does subsidize those costs. So the next slides will discuss the changes, if any, from the study session. So for the administrative fees, there was one change that was accidentally omitted from the staff report, and this would be the electric vehicle charging fee at Wheeler Plaza. This has been recommended to be a pass-through fee to offset the cost of electricity and other operational or maintenance costs on our end. This fee of 25 cents per kilowatt hour is similar to other agencies in the county. Redwood City is 27 cents, San Mateo is also 25 cents, and Burlingame is 30 cents. There were no other changes recommended, and since these fees are not subject to a 60-day noticing requirement, they will become effective July 1st, 2022. There were no changes recommended to the proposed police fee schedule, and similar to the administrative fees, these are not subject to the 60-day noticing requirement, so this fee schedule would also become effective on July 1st, 2022. Fire prevention fees are separate from the fee study scope of review since these services are contracted from the City of Redwood City. So as done in prior years, staff recommends adopting user fees based on the Redwood City user fee schedule. This would be a development fee, so it would require a 60-day noticing period, so these fees would be effective August 29, 2022. For public works and engineering, there were no changes recommended to the proposed fee schedule presented in May. And since these fees are also primarily related to development, they're subject to the 60-day noticing requirement. So they would become effective on August 29th. There's no recommended changes to the surcharges. There are two surcharges as part of our uh, fee schedule. There's a general plan surcharge, which is applied to new construction and additions to existing square footage and the technology surcharge, which is a fee that's intended to recover the cost of implementation and future upgrades of the city's permitting and cashiering system applications. 
Since the primary users of these systems are the Community Development Department and Public Works, these would be subject to the 60-day noticing requirement and therefore would become effective on August 29th. So there was a lot of discussion in May at the study session and concerns about the large increases in certain fees related to residential development and other various residential fees. In response, several of the recommended fee increases related to community development have been split to fully cover the costs over a two-year period. Tiered fees include design review, the domestic foul, historic preservation, plan checks, and pre-application reviews. There are also certain building permits that have been tiered to reduce the large cost increase. In addition to the tiering of the cost, there was some discussion about the dead tree fees. An inspection is still required, but since it's charged at actual cost, it's expected that the fee will be less than the time needed to inspect a healthy tree. So although we're recommending the splitting of the cost over these fees over two years, it's also recommended that the second year be subject to CPI as the cost plan is based on current year costs and would also escalate in the next year. So I know I realize these slides are a little hard to read, but I thought it might be helpful to illustrate how the tiering is working over the two years. So you can see that the first column is what we're charging now, and the next two columns are the revised fee for the next fiscal year, and the third column and fourth column after that are the proposed fee for the second year to get to full cost recovery. So these are how the planning design review fees would, would look. And these are the design review fees that require planning commission review and approval as well as the sign program. And you can see that we've tiered these as well. And in addition to the design review, I mentioned there were some other residential fees that we felt could also be tiered. And these include the domestic foul or non-household pet fee, historic preservation fee, the planning cost for plan check related to building permits, and then the pre-application development review. So on the building side, the building permits were tiered for the lower assessed projects for single family residential. as well as the multifamily residential side on the smaller scale. So moving to parks and recreation, as we discussed at the study session, the per player field use fee was also recommended to tier over two years to recover 100% of the total field costs. In addition to tiering the fee, the council requested that some funding be set aside to allow for a scholarship program so that the field use fee would not be a barrier to participation. As such, staff has recommended an allocation of $10,000 equally divided across the sports leagues to supplement approximately 5% of each league's current registration numbers of the proposed per player fee. This information was relayed to the San Carlos Athletic Sites Advisory Council, or ASAC, at their meeting held on May 31st. And it's recommended that this would be an effective date of August 29th to allow the sports teams and the leagues some time to implement it into their schedules. So future fee increases, we're recommending that the council adopt guidelines to adjust most fees annually based on the CPIW or CPI West, which is the San Francisco, Oakland, San Jose, Bay Area, Urban Wage Earners and Clerical Workers Consumer Price Index. This is the same index that we've used in prior years. And the reason for this is a comprehensive user fee study is not an annual requirement and only becomes valuable over time following significant shifts in the organization, local practices, legislative values, or legal requirements. And as I mentioned before, even though we're tiering the fees over two years, it's still recommended that the second year would be subject to the CPI. So in summary, these are the recommended changes for council action tonight. Uh, one would be to adopt the administrative and police fee schedules with an effective date of July 1st, 2022. Adopt the development-related fee schedules with an effective date of August 29th, 22, 
2022, allowing for that 60-day noticing period. Adopt guidelines for future year increases based on the CPIW index. And appropriate $10,000 from the general fund unassigned balance for a field use fee scholarship program. So that concludes my presentation. I'm available for questions. Nicole Kissam from MBS is available remotely. We have staff here who can also answer questions. Thank you, Rebecca. Questions from council? Council Member Dugan. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Just another quick one. This uh, $10,000 field use fee scholarship program, is that per year or is this gonna be a one-time thing? Um, we can incorporate it into the annual budget. Okay. So it would be an ongoing. Yeah, I would like to see that as a annual annual thing. Thank you. I too have a question about that. Um, and this might be a question for Amy. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering what the response was from the ASAC meeting, what the sports teams, how they received that, if they felt like that was a good amount of money, and how is that 10,000, how many different leagues is that divided between, and how is that making an impact? Sure. Um, Amy Newby, Parks and Recreation Director. Um, they understood the increase and they were really appreciative of the idea of a scholarship program for participants that couldn't afford that big jump. Um, as Rebecca mentioned, it does, um, the $10,000, we looked at proportionally between each league of our most recent participation. So I think it was about seven or eight leagues. There's a few um, like summer baseball teams that are part of that group. So it's about 5% of each league we're budgeting for for scholarships. Um, of course, if we're seeing that that's hitting the max from the get-go, we can come back to council and ask for more money. Um, but we uh, we think that that's going to be sufficient. But of course, we'll come back if it's not. Okay. Thank you. Yes, please come back if um, it's not sufficient. And then my second question is on the domestic foul um, increase. <laughs> This is going to be Andrea. So I'll wait for you to come up. And I know we've already discussed this, and I don't want to make Council Member Par uh, Collins mad by rehashing this, but um, <laughs> I, so after our last discussion, I happened to have a conversation with a family who um, does chickens for 4 H. And it seems like here in San Carlos, a lot of, well, not a lot, but who, people who have chickens in their backyards, it, it can be associated with children's doing, children doing a 4-H project. And so this jump from 300 to 900 and then up to almost 1,800, that seems really like a, a big jump for a family that's just doing chickens for a 4-H project. So I wanted to ask, um, you know, are there that many people raising backyard fowl where we need to increase this? Or if it's only like a dozen people, do we, do we really need to increase this? Because it seems significant and fairly burdensome on a family. Uh, sure, so Andrea Martisich, Principal Planner. Um, I need to check the animal code requirements because there is a threshold for which you need a domestic fowl permit. We have not processed any that I can think of recently, even for 4-H, for so it's not a common permit. Um, the, the last one we did, I believe, was a year ago, and it was for a very large project. So this is not something okay. we normally see. Okay, so if someone were just to have a couple chickens in a coop in their backyard, they maybe would not be subject to needing this permit? Right, I need to look up that there's a threshold for the, for the amount in the animal code, um, so I'd have to see what that is. Um, we also had an inquiry for um, chickens at one of the schools as part of a 4-H project. That did not require a permit because it was through the school itself, so. Hmm. So, okay. I can look that up and come back up. Oh, okay. All right. I guess we could do that while I, while I take public comment. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay. I guess we'll go to public comment. Uh, if you would like to make public comment on this item on fees, now is the time. You may raise your hand via Zoom. Is there any public comment, Crystal? No, I don't see any hands. Okay. We're going to give Andrea just a couple minutes to look up uh, domestic fowl.
I would love to ask for In the for meantime, that I'll motion. move we close the public hearing. Second. Crystal, could you please call the roll for the public hearing? Council Member Palmer Lohan? Yes. Vice Mayor Rack? Yes. Council Member Dugan? Yes. Council Member Collins? Yes. And Mayor McDowell? Yes. Thank you, Crystal. Okay, we have an answer on the chickens. We do, thank you for your patience. Uh, so the limit is four, the threshold is four. Okay. So if you have more than four, then you um, are supposed to apply for a permit. Okay, yes. great. I appreciate that exception. I think that will make 4 Hers happy. All right, any further discussion on this item? Just, uh, seeing none, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Um, Vice Mayor Rack and then Council Member Dugan. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I guess I've don't have a, that, thank you for the clarification on the, the chickens uh, foul. Um, I just, I'm, I'm gonna support this fee uh, structure cause, and, and partly because we have the CPI index in there because I, I, I guess I just feel like we're, I know it's a large increase but it's covering our costs and it's for development where people are generally benefiting from the development and their their homes are gaining value. They're, they're basically gaining value on the backs of the taxpayers, which I don't think is a good way to do this. But given that we're adjusting it over two years and the CPI is in there, so we won't have this issue again, I'll support this reluctantly because I do think we shouldn't be costing the taxpayers money. We should be using that money for other things instead. Um, versus, and I, so I would, I would have preferred for us to do the impact fees in one year and do that because I think that's a better approach and uh, it, it would allow, free up money for us to do other services uh, when people are benefiting from, the, from that. So I may change my mind before the end of the night. Council Member Dugan. Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. And I'll just say, uh, yeah, thank you, Adam. I think it is worth pausing here and, and just recognizing these are some hefty fee increases and, and I know they're, you know, tied directly to our actual costs as a city, but, you know, we should take that as a challenge to keep looking for efficiencies and, and other ways not to, you know, just pass major fees on. Um, you know, I think most residents will be surprised that the fifth chicken will cost them 1800 bucks. So, um, but uh, I'm glad that the first four are uh, under the radar as it were. So, um, and then I'll just say, I, I um, uh, agree with Sarah that um, definitely come back to us uh, if the 10,000 is enough for that scholarship program. Definitely want to uh, uh, be open-minded with that. And I definitely want that to be an annual um, allotment. So with that, I, I support this. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any further discussion, so I will entertain, did I take public comment? I did, okay, it's getting late. Um, I'll entertain a motion. I'll do it. Okay, uh, I move to adopt resolution 2022-79, a resolution of the City Council of the City of San Carlos authorizing adjustments to the cost of services schedule, user fees, and the approval of additional budget appropriation in the amount of $10,000 from the general fund, unassigned fund balance to establish a field use fee scholarship program for fiscal year 2022-2023 and to adopt guidelines for future fee increases. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Crystal, could you, oh, I'm sorry, further discussion, um, Vice Mayor? I'm, I'm actually gonna vote no on this because I, I, I just don't think we should be subsidizing people's development projects, so. But I, I support all the other fees and the scholarship fee, but uh, I just don't think that's the right approach. Okay, noted. Any further discussion? Yes, Madam Mayor. Uh, so, Adam, you're, you're saying you would want it to be 100% cost recovery? Is that what you're saying? Development and planning fees, because I feel like we are, we are subsidizing 
the, we are subsidizing uh, development by uh, homeowners, individuals who are directly benefiting from that development at the cost of the taxpayers. I see. I, we do get to 100% after two years, though, right? We, but we don't in the coming year. Okay. So we are subsidizing that, and I think that money can be used for other things in the community. I'm going to vote in favor of this because having been through a remodel myself, I recognize that you start the planning process several years in advance of construction, and um, I think that it's a good idea to give a little breathing room to those who have budgeted and made plans, so I appreciate the two-year um, implementation. Any other discussion? Seeing none, Crystal, could you please? Oh, I'm sorry, Council Member Palmer lohan um, thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to echo your comments, um, and I recognize um, and I appreciate, Adam Rec, uh, Vice Mayor, your perspective on this. Um, I, from, from my perspective, the first time this came before us, I was um, a little taken aback about um, just the increases <laughs> and the and the um, and how um, steep they were, just in general. And <clears throat> I recall that in the last meeting, I, I asked if there's some way that we could smooth them out over over time. Um, in light of the fact that we're facing incredible um, inflationary pressures right now with gas, for example, being almost $7 a gallon, um, groceries have gone up quite a bit, and I appreciate um, uh, Mayor, uh, uh, Mayor's comments with respect to home remodels. Um, I, I don't have the stomach <laughs> for that type of work right now, uh, so I haven't gone through it before, uh, but I imagine myself, you know, at some point in the future, maybe doing that type of work and seeing the, the jump um, and those uh, fees was definitely concerning to me. So I do appreciate staff kind of rounding it out. And I would just suggest that, you know, as we move forward, um, let's not let that uh, step be so steep in the future. Let's try to stay ahead and on top of this. Uh, so to your point, Vice Mayor Rock, we can make sure that we have adequate resources for other programs. So I think it's... Okay, thank you, Laura. I see no further hands raised, so could you please call the roll? Councilmember Collins? Yes. Councilmember Palmer Lohan? Yes. Vice Mayor Rack? No. Councilmember Dugan? Yes. And Mayor McDowell? Yes. Okay, thank you, everyone. We'll move on to agenda setting. Um, items discussed in this agenda setting section will be considered by the council for placing on a future agenda. No action will be taken. Um, item A is consideration of agendizing an item to consider calling on Sutter Health to reopen the Mac E. Michelson Arthritis Rehabilitation Center Therapy Pool in San Mateo. I put this on the agenda um, through Jeff, and um, this was in response to an email that I believe we all received about a week ago um, that noted that several cities had passed resolutions in support of this measure, including the county, and um, I would be open to bringing back something along those lines on consent. And if you want me to explain further, I'm, I'm happy to, but I think we all got that email. I'm fine with that. Good. Okay. Sounds like we have agreement. Thank you. Any other agenda setting items for this evening? Okay, I will note for the public that council will be on recess for the month of July, and um, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Laura. <laughs>